at this point, uh, we're effectively recording the class. So guys, welcome to the class. Sorry for the rough start. It only took us an hour to get our feet on, you know, uh, our bearings here. Ah, it's the first time I teach back at Miami Day since the pandemic. I haven't touched foot in this campus since then, so it's kind of fun and weird to be back all at the same time. Uh, I've been teaching these classes remotely, and they've been very successful um, since the pandemic. I mean, I mean, they were successful before the pandemic, but they were equally successful during the pandemic as well. Uh, lots of interesting things have happened uh, during the pandemic. Uh, just so you know, I became a Katia champion during that time. So in 2020, uh, doing work and research with people on the international front, uh, we recreated Santiago Catrawa's bridge in Bilbao in Katia and did that with another person working in South Korea, working 3D uh, in real time across the globe. I can't claim to be the first person in the world to do this, but I can tell you among the first who've ever done this and, and among the first who've done it in the building industry, I can tell you, I don't know anybody else who's actually done that. What that means is that there's two people co-authoring a bridge, co-authoring a structure, co-authoring a, a, a complex model. That doesn't mean that we have two models. There's only one model. I'm modeling the project in Miami and the other guy is modeling the project in South Korea. I don't speak Korean. He doesn't speak English. And we were able to build the bridge. So I think when you talk about the collaboration and what's possible in this platform called Katia, it's very high. And um, so you know what? There's probably a lot of places that I can begin this conversation from. And we're going to jump into the technology here in a minute, but I want to kind of lay the groundwork a little bit. So, KT is not the standard. And as you go into the world, and you're going to be here for the, every, the people in this class are here for different reasons. Um, KT is not the standard. Is that a good or bad thing? I don't know. I'm not here to tell you how to think or what to think. I'm going to give you information and you need to make your mind up about it. You need to make your own choices. I'm not going to tell you what the right answer is. There are many answers and many right answers. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit of a joker because I like to joke around a bit. Uh, there's sometimes you need humor to convey complex ideas. Um, I don't really like the stand. I, you know, I don't like to drive a standard car. I don't want a standard relationship. I don't want a standard kiss. I don't want a standard vacation. I don't want a standard house. Now, if you have nothing and someone gave you a standard house, you'd probably be grateful because opposed to living on a bunch of rocks and some dirt, a standard house is better than no house at all. So there is a place in this world for standard. Standard shoes, standard car, standard food, standard coffee. And we drink standard coffee all up. You go to, um, well, let's see, you go to uh, Waffle House, and you're gonna get standard coffee. You go to McDonald's, you can get standard coffee. You go to Denny's, you're gonna get standard coffee. But if you want more premium stuff, then you gotta step it up, right? And you can pay as much as eight, nine dollars for coffee these days. Okay, and it's just a cup of coffee. So, there's a world for standards. We all have had standard coffee. We've all, I'm sure you've had better quality coffee, premium roast, but you've also had standard coffee. And there's maybe times you even ask for standard coffee. What does that mean? It means that in the world, there is a space for standard. And if you want to build standard buildings, then knock yourself out. Most software, caters to the standard and there's nothing wrong with that if your business model requires you to do standard buildings in a fast and effective and efficient way there's software that does that and but it's the standard meaning you're not doing anything outside of the standard okay all the architecture in the world that we love and celebrate as architects and as designers and as engineers i can promise you that most of it not to say all of it, 
is not done in standard software. And that's the big joke. So the problem is if you live only in the world of standard, you have an invisible ceiling that's going to prevent you from ever getting to the high end. You'll never get there because your tools will keep you from getting there. Does that make sense? I didn't make the rules, guys. I'm, you can call me the liberator if you want. What do I care about? And again, I'm talking about Hector Camp, specifically me as a human being. What do I care about? I care about going above the standard. I care about doing the impossible. I care about doing something no one's ever been able to do before. The standard is not about innovation. The standard is about everything we've done in the past. So the standard likes to look backwards. And I happen to be a person that I like looking forward. Not that there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with what's in the rear view mirror. And sometimes we need to look back to get some reference, right? Um, we don't want to throw away the past. So we don't want to throw away our history. We want to look back and take from whatever was good about it. And we want to bring that forward. So when we're dealing with the technology that we're dealing with, um, it's about going forward. It's not about the standard. So you might encounter people who won't understand what it is that you're doing with this technology because they live in the standard. And here you come with some crazy building, some impossibility. And they're like, yeah, we, we can't do that. No, no, you can't do that. I can't. So, you know, I'll give you a physical real world example. In 1998, Frank Gehry developed the Guggenheim and Bilbao. This was at a time when the entire world was into the AutoCAD and nobody even thought about doing 3D. Not even a dream. It was like something from science fiction movies, all right? Well, impossible. And all of a sudden, Frank not only does a building that was completely developed in 3D, of the absolutely most complex architectural structure you've ever seen, he did it the first time out the gate this way. Okay? When nobody else was even doing a doghouse in 3D. So the world was shocked. How did this happen? How is it that Frank Gehry is so vastly superior to everything that we're doing? And none of us can even come anywhere close. Why? Because they were working on standard software okay? and, and standard technologies and standard processes. And Frank broke out of the standard. There was nothing standard about what he wanted to do. I, I also want to make, I know, I want to make a point. Frank had a need. He wanted to do something that wasn't standard. He wanted to do something that was innovative and he wanted to do something that was unique. Something that was of high architectural expression. And because he had, I want to call this from the world of business, I want to call this, he had this driver. That driver drove him to use technologies that would accomplish the goal of him doing his high-end architectural expression. So he had a passion. And that passion drove everything. The money, the investors, the projects, the clients, the hardware, the software, the changes in processes, whatever it took to make that building happen. And nothing was left unturned. So um, Frank Gehry used Katia to accomplish that. And the whole world in the building industry in 1998 said, holy shit, what just happened? Because technologically, that's impossible, right? And that yet, it's not just an idea, it's worse. It's a build building that you can go touch, and that changes everything, all right? And around 2000, I think the building industry had an opportunity to change, and it did change. Um, that revolutionized the industry to the point they turned it upside down, and people started going crazy, and all the software vendors took hundreds of millions of dollars injected into the software to throw it into the marketplace. And this enormous race of 3D began, right? All of this freaked out, like, oh my God, if the building industry were to wake up tomorrow and realize 
They, there's a tool like a deal that's now available to the building industry that will revolutionize the entire process front to back. Uh, we're doomed. So what they did was they took a lot of money and they marketed, they bought a software called Revit and they marketed the hell out of it. To the point they gave it away for free to anybody, anywhere, any place that needed it. And they seeded it and they spent hundreds of millions of dollars to associate the word BIM with Revit technology. And, you know, if I can pull myself off the planet and you know, get that 30,000 foot view, it was a good thing in the sense that it helped the industry adopt 3D as a process for building buildings. And if you want to look at it from that perspective, yeah, that was a good thing that, that all of this made a tool like Revit more accessible to a large portion of the population um, who are now shifting from starting a building from 2D to now beginning to explore it in 3D. So where 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 is Kitia in all this? Um, it's interesting because what is Revit relative? So the question I usually get, and, and you might be thinking about it if you're in the audience, you know, what is Revit and how is it different than Katia uh, or how is it the same? So what do they have in common? Well, they both make models, right? Katia makes a model, uh, Revit makes a model. Revit makes a design intent model. I'm going to use the word cartoon, but I don't mean it in any offensive way. It makes a representation of a building, but it isn't the building. It just looks like the building. Um, it doesn't take into account constructability, fabrication, manufacturing, construction, sequencing, assembly processes. It doesn't go there. It doesn't get into the nuts and bolts. It does a representation of a building. And again, don't get me wrong, there is a place for that. And there are jobs out there for just doing that in the standard industry. So what if, if you were to ask me, I would say, well, Revit automates the standard. Remember, I'm saying it is not the standard. What Revit does, it automates the industry standard. So whatever the standard is, Revit, to try to make things go faster, tries to automate the standard. Now, take it back to the world of Katia. Does Katia care about the standard? Does Katia want to be the industry standard software? Um, after looking at the issue for a very long time, I don't think the soul's intentions are for Katia to become the industry standard. That's not a bad thing. They like being not the standard. Why? Because they like the high end of things. And Katia is not a software for an industry. Although it's being used in the building industry, many other industries, it's not an industry industry specific software. Like Revit is an industry specific software to automate the standard of the building industry. Katia is a tool flexible enough that if you want to go build a battleship with it tomorrow, you can. If you want to then shift and build the space shuttle, you can. If you didn't want to change your mind and build this computer right here, you can. If you want to go build a Frank Gehry building, you can. If you want to build a Zahadi building, you can. But you can also build a drone. And you can also build a train. And build anything you want. And it's not a representation of the building. In other words, where they start to get different is where Katia allows you to do what's called a virtual twin. So it lets you completely in 3D recreate any asset, not just model it, but its behavior as well. So how it performs, how it behaves in the physical world, what it does, you can simulate it 100%. So Katia tries to recreate the known universe, and I mean universe because it thinks at the scale of planets. Because you can build space shuttles and things, and because you're building structures and that go into space, they start to think they start to take into account gravity and really weird things. And you can even specify which planet you're working on. I don't don't ask me. I don't know, but you can you can do that in Katia. You can say, hey, we're working on Mars and just for Mars. Don't ask me. I don't know. 
But it can go as far as that, right? Because it's not thinking about just this planet, it's really thinking about the universe. So all the physical known, I say no because every day we discover things. All the physical things that we know about the universe are built into Katia, which makes it an awesome analytics platform. So when it comes to simulating and analytics, is great because it gives you that virtual environment where you're able to test your ideas, not only come up with the idea, fully develop it, all, all what's called end-to-end, -end, meaning from the original concept all the way to fabrication and manufacturing, from end to end. Revit, for example, is not a tool that goes from end to end. Why not? Well, one, because the building industry is fragmented, meaning that we don't develop things from end to end. We, we take it from one stage and then we hand it off to another team, which then takes it to another stage and then they hand it off to another team, then they take it to another stage, and then we hand it off to another team who then construct and operate the building. So let me back that up. In the broken industry standard, which I don't like or care about, Okay, let's just be transparent here. You start from the design process, right? You do the design and then you stop. And then you hand that off to another person, it could be another engineer, a contractor, and they absorb that model. And sometimes they even have to start over again, right? And then they go through their design and construction process and then they, they stop. And then they hand that off to an owner who may or may not use that data to control own and operate the building. When you're talking about a tool like Katia, you're talking about a tool that comes from industries, and I don't mean just this industry, aerospace, defense, automotive, right, electronics, it comes from industries that in their core belief system, they believe that what makes most sense for them to do is to develop a process from end to end. So as they design it, engineer it, and work with manufacturing and fabrication and the distribution of that product into the world and the fabrication of that product into the world and the management of that product in the world, it is managed from end to end. So for example, what would be an example of that? An example that would be an airplane. So when a company like Boeing decides to build an airplane, they have suppliers all over the entire world Right, and those suppliers are all working on the same airplane. So they they develop the airplane, and everybody's working on the airplane. And what happens? Those parts are manufactured, and fabricated, and assembled worldwide. And then they're shipped to this place like Seattle, for example. They arrive as large components, and guess what? They come. You know, let's say your Rolls Royce engines. You model and you build the entire engine off of the model of the airplane that they're working on. They'll build that engine specifically for that airplane. When it's all packaged and ready to go, they'll ship it to um, um, Seattle, and the engine fits right the first time. Why? Because it was built by the same definition that built the airplane. So it's one definition that built everything in the airplane, from the chairs to the seats to the plastic moldings to, to the instrumentation panel. It's all coming from the same model. Okay, we don't work that way. But the aerospace and defense industry works that way. Automotive works that way. So, what does that mean for us? Well, for the last 20 years, because I began to become aware about of this problem about 20 years ago. For the last 20 years, 20 years ago, I was having conversations with people about this exact problem I just described. And, and it became obvious that, holy, holy, holy cow, that if you could do the same thing that we're doing in, in the world of aerospace, with an airplane, if we could do that with a building, we would revolutionize the building industry. Right? So that that proposition, the, the power in that realization motivated me that I've dedicated the last 20 years of my life to that person, to, to the pursuit of that, of, of that outcome, right? Of how we begin to do it. Where I think we've gotten in trouble is because it's not the standard, it hasn't reached the whole industry. So when you look at a tool like Ikea, you're going to say, 
once you finish looking at Katia, the, the response that everybody says to them, I've been doing this for a long time now, is like, oh my god, why doesn't the whole industry use this? Every student goes to this, but everyone who's ever used Katia arrives at the same conclusion. <sighs> yeah, because it's not the standard. So what do we deal with this problem? Again, I'm just giving you my perspective. Uh, it is what it is. What do we deal with it? How do we handle this problem? What do we do with this problem in the world? The way that problem is dealt with right now is that the world has allowed the industry to fail. Meaning that if you don't know any better, no one's going to come out and help you and show you a better way. They're going to let you do it the hard way and they're going to let you waste your time and they're going to let you fail. There's no incentive to help you. I know that's cruel and mean and terrible, but that's what happens. So what, what, what happens in the world is that the fact that other people are inefficient, fragmented, and broken is an advantage to you when you use Katia. Because Katia is the opposite of everything I just have. Katia is integrated end to end. So companies can obtain a competitive advantage and have. Frank Gehry became a multi-millionaire as an architect. Millions. He made millions. He has millions from what he did. All right? He was liberated. But that liberation made him a wealthy man. He thought out of the box and he broke out of the standard. And by breaking out of the standard, he cashed in. Okay? That was how he did it. And he it made and it made incredible things. So another person who did that was Sahadid. Um, Sahadid's firm is one of my favorite firms in the entire world. Once upon a time, Sahadid was described as a paper architect. From the perspective, she was a great designer, but you're never gonna build anything. Okay? And she almost died a paper architect. And then all of a sudden, by embracing tools, not only this one, but embracing tools that took her out of the standard, she began to build buildings that the world couldn't do. She broke out of the mold, and now she has a, I don't know, a 400 person firm uh, with projects worldwide, making millions and millions of dollars, completely successful, outrageously successful, leading innovation and architectural world day in and day out um what, what can i say she broke out of the standard so by breaking out of the standard she now people and becoming established doing this when the world wants an exotic building they go to sahadid and they pay her fees okay and she can get those buildings built because she's embraced standard new processes that allow those buildings to be built but they have broken out of the mold they're using um everything from 3d printing to modeling to structural analysis to optimization they're doing everything all right and that that is opening up the world for them and, but they're not doing the standard now it's i don't want to present an either or situation or a black and white us them situation i don't really buy into us them so even when you have a frank gary building or a sahadi building or a coop hemming blau or morphosis or any of these kinds of people's work some portion of that building is standard why because standard gives you economy one of the things that, that you get from a standard you get economy so if everything was custom made you know, the doors were custom made, and the handles were custom made, and the hinges were custom made, if the, the wall structures were custom made, the ceiling tiles were custom made, the floors custom made, you're going to have a really expensive building, wouldn't you agree? When I used to work for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, guess what? We used to use Katia and the design, engineering, construction, fabrication of some of, not all of them, but half of the vessels created by Royal Caribbean. Those cruise ships were 100% as close to 100% as you can get custom made. Everything, man. The chairs were made for the ships. The rugs were custom made for the ships. The ceilings were custom made for the ships. Everything was custom made for the ship. Well, those ships were costing 
upwards of four to six to eight hundred million dollars and today they're in the billions okay when you see one of those big vessels out there you're looking at a vessel of maybe 1.2 billion dollars today um when i used to work for them um 400 million was a lot of money and today they reached about 1.2 billion dollars but you're talking about people that everything is custom made on that ship there's nothing they they have the money and you might be wondering why why do they have so much money well you uh, you never realize those things are floating casino money making printing machines and they when that ship goes out every time the ship goes out it comes back with 20 million dollars in profit from the casino by itself every time and that's what i'm lowballing that number okay lowballing that number so yeah they don't care because they need to develop or don't lose sight um i get enamored with the technology but don't lose sight of the business drivers because it's important to understand what pulls things and make it happen so when i used to work for royal caribbean i used to work across from the guy who was the financial modeler if you want to call him that and he had a model of the ship and he had a, a an algorithm based on you know if the ship was so big and we had so many passengers or the casino would generate so much money and he would come up with a formula that says okay we can afford a 800 million dollar ship right but he knew that developing a ship like that and delivering a wow factor experience was going to bring people to that ship and get them to spend a lot of money and attract really uh, affluent travelers that would drop fifty thousand hundred thousand dollars in the casino right so those ships are over the top why because they need to attract that kind of buyer then pays for us to do all the things that we're talking about so that gave us outrageous budgets to do anything right so it's important to understand what pulls money and what pulls and drives these innovations when you look at some of these uh, buildings the famous ones that are operating at that level things like the neuro symphony concert hall here in miami these are assets that are investments for the society right so they're not your typical buildings they're buildings that when the community invests in them they, they are anchors for that society right people travel around the world to come see that building or come to a concert there um that is so true that when frank gary did the guggenheim that building generated millions of visitors to the point that the city of bilbao couldn't handle the amount of people that all of a sudden was flocking to the city they didn't have enough hotel rooms for all the people who are coming to see millions of people from around the entire world who never thought about Bilbao, all of a sudden that building put Bilbao on the map and you had a global community of world travelers that arrived in Bilbao all of a sudden to come see this building. To the point they coined it the Bilbao effect. Okay. And cities that in one invest in culture and want to attract these these affluent world travelers that travel from around the world to come see works of architecture and they're part of that art community they are trying to invest in and let's call them star architects to drive their economy so people will come to see to see those arts and recreation they will come here to see those works of art like people come to see the Sahadi tower I follow Sahadi when I go around the world and travel. I go see her buildings. I follow Frank Gehry's work. I go see his buildings when I travel. All right, so that moves a lot of travel. And, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. Let me back up for a minute. The World Expo. The World Expo is happening in Dubai right now. It was happening in 2020, but you know what happened in 2020. All right, so um they spent billions and billions of dollars building the world expo expecting the whole world to show up and all of a sudden flights were canceled and nobody can travel so the government of dubai did a thing when they're saying look you know what um we need another year so they extended it 
into 2021 and it's still ongoing. So you can go to Dubai right now and see the World Expo in Dubai, which has incredible works of architecture, design, engineering, incredible, incredible projects worthy of you getting on a plane and flying over there just to go see them, right? But of course, with the whole COVID situation that made that almost bankrupted that situation because they expected millions of visitors that were not allowed to travel. Uh, and there's still, it's difficult to still, and a lot of countries aren't even that opened up yet, right? We're just slowly coming out of the dark ages now and, and starting to like go back into world travel. So anyway, so that's, um, that's my, um, my framework, my foundation of the, the way I kind of see this right now. Do you guys have any questions about anything I've said so far? All right, we're talking about the standard and you're going to you're going to bump up against the standard issue it, it, it reeks his ugly head from time to time but what's important when you do face it and you will have to face it architects have to explain to the client why we're building this exotic building that costs 10 times more money than the regular building and the owner might not understand he said why are we building this so much Mr. Architect, why are we building this such a complex building? Can't we get this accomplished with a box? And he, you, the answer may be yes or no, you know? Yeah, we, maybe we can get something accomplished with a box, but is it going to really drive the the audience you want to capture for your building? If, if the answer is no, then we need to start to look at other options, right? Remember, we're solving problems with buildings. And... A lot of what I do in the world of technology is we actually put these tools to solve social problems, right? So um, you will come up against, from time to time, you're going to come up against the standard. I'm in the world of business. I can tell you people want the, they want the right answer and they want the one size fits all. Um, what I can tell you, and being open and transparent and, and ethical and professional about it, the right answer is you have to use a software that meets your needs. So whatever software meets your needs, if that's AutoCAD, great. If that's a pencil and paper on a sketch pad, wonderful, right? If it's a crayon, fantastic. But if it's something else, then you got to look at something else. So the right software is whichever one means you need. So having said that, where do we begin? Well, I like to begin in the real world. I start from outcomes. So when I'm deciding um, which tools and which technologies I use or how am I going to approach a problem, I look at the outcome and I start from outcome and I go backwards from outcome. In 2017, I did the anthropology store on Lincoln Road and the anthropology store had a complex um, outer shell and relatively standard building on the inside. What was complicated about it was the outside of the building. So could I have done the whole thing in Katia? 100%. Um, but goes back to the standard. So one way to look at it, I use standard software to do the standard components of the building. Why? Because the software has been optimized to do the standard. So if Revit is optimized to do the standard, I did the standard in Revit. And then for all the non-standard elements of the building, which was the entire shell of the building, I did that 100% in Katia, which drove the construction, fabrication, manufacturing, and assembly of those panels. So the client hired me because they were worried about the curtain wall system of the building. They didn't know if it, the building was properly enclosed, if water was going to you know, penetrate the building, it was going to leak. Um, the form was very complicated. The tolerance was really high. They were really uncomfortable about it. All right. And I came in and I modeled it for to solve those problems. So I went backwards. I knew that that model needed to drive the manufacturing and fabrication of those kernel walls. So I started with the end, 
we need to have a high fidelity model that the manufacturer can rely on to construct, manufacture, and install these panels. So, because that was my end point, which was my start point, I was then able to justify to the client why we're doing this in Katia, opposed to just staying in Revit, for example. All right, so I did a hybrid between a half of a Revit model and a half of a Katia model. Now, so Katia has this fully integrated environment, which um, these other companies in the world use to maintain a competitive advantage in the world because they have their entire supply chain integrated from endpoint to endpoint, um, all co-authoring. Katia is a platform that can handle up to 65,000 people contributing to a model at the same time. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Imagine every chair in this entire school all working on one model. That's Katia, man. You can really do that. And, and now I'll take those people and distribute them around the entire world. That's Katia. Okay, so it's hard to explain what Katia is and how powerful the tool this is. Now, but because not every part of that building was unique, I didn't have any reason to model. There was nothing unique about the door. There was nothing unique about the floors. There was nothing unique about the columns, the regular concrete ones, or even the foundation to that. So there was nothing really unique about it. So I modeled that in um, in Revit, and then all the components that really needed to be high fidelity, meaning they had to be high levels of tolerance. I modeled those in Katia because we were going to drive manufacturing and fabrication off of it, and that save the project. Uh, as a matter of fact, that saved a lot of the components on the structure because at one point we had some decorative elements and the um, and they were decorative in the half a million dollar number. And when I talked to the contractor, I'm like, what are these weird calm things that are here and what are those things doing now? No, like, they're doing nothing. I'm like, what do you mean they're doing nothing? I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're just decorative. What do you mean they're decorative? Like, this is a really expensive element to the building to be decorative. But like, yeah, they're not really working. I'm like, well, how are we attaching the current wall to the building? Oh, we're going to attach it to the structure. So you're telling me these elements that look structural are not working? Nah, they're not working. I'm like, does the owner know this? I'm like, nope. I'm like, well, if you want this to survive, make sure he never finds out about it. Because the moment he realizes that you can just take them away and toss them, that's a half a million dollars he doesn't need to spend. Uh, and they're doing no work. Um, it's a nice idea. So when I started working with the structure with the current wall, I was able to shift a decorative column and convert it into a working column that would now carry the load for the current wall system, salvaging the design of the architect and shifting it from an idea into something that's actually functioning and working and, and and helping build the building and not just giving the aesthetics of the building, right? Um, I gave it function, I gave it use, and I gave it purpose. And if it didn't have those elements, function, use, and purpose, it's going to get body engineered out. So I worked with the architect to make sure I salvaged his design and it made it real. Shifted it from an idea and made it real, made it work, and literally, functionally made it work. So, all right, so let's um, that's where we're at in this class. I'm gonna ask you, you gotta find your own why. I know Mohammed has a why, you know, you need to find your own why to help you find your own why. I have my why's, I talked about some of those why's. But you need to have your own why. You you know, I I sell this to people, meaning architects, design clients, you guys, from the and even to Miami Dade College because I'm up against the I'm up against the uh, Inquisition right now because Miami Dade wants to standardize a lot of the software and I'm the only guy capable of teaching Katia. And they're like, no, no, professor, you can't be the favorite teaching Katia. You need to teach the same crap we all teach. I'm like, you're killing me, man. You know, I can't go backwards and I can't do less. I can only do more, but I can't do less and I can't go backwards. It just doesn't work for me. If you know how, you can't go from a Lamborghini to a golf cart, man. 
You just can't. You can't. Your body won't let you, man. You just, you just can't. You know better. You can't go from eating good food to eating bad food because you know what good food tastes like. You know? It's, it's, I mean, you can be forced into it, but you're not going to be happy. You know? You can eat that nasty hamburger, but you know if you had that filet mignon last night, it's not the same. You know? It's just, you're going to suffer. So, I can't do it. So, but it's important to understand the why. And I'm having to help Miami Dade College also understand the why. You need to have your own why answered, and your clients need to have their why answered. All right. One of the whys that I'm most excited about is the uh, design freedom. Again, going back to the problem of standard. Standard. When something is standard is very defined and they're not the reason why it's economical is because no one's thinking about it anymore so if you do let's say a structure that the whole world is familiar with when you go to the city hall to get a permit they're like yeah yeah we've seen this crap a million times i've been here for 40 years there's nothing unique about what you do approved right because you did nothing special i know it sounds terrible right nothing special you're the same as everybody else. Doesn't mean, doesn't give me the warm fuzzies, right? But that's what standards do. So the problem with a standard is that it limits imagination, it limits creativity, it limits architectural expression. It only gives you economies of scale from the world of business and finance and just helps you get to the market faster because there's nothing special about it. When you do something special, things tend to slow down a little bit. You show up with a building that the city hall's never seen before, they're like, wow, we, we, we don't know, man. You know, we need to see engineering calcs for all this stuff. Because we, we don't we don't trust it, you know? I don't I don't know what this is. I've never seen it before. So they'll proceed with caution and it may increase prices because they may make you um you know, go there, build a couple of structures and blow them up just to make sure that they can take the load. And you may have to prove that that wall can carry the load, that that column is going to carry the load, that that really unique structural element is going to actually work. And so it may increase the price when, the, when people look at that and it's unfamiliar. But you know what? Everyone who's come before you, the Frank Gary, the Zahadis, even, even, uh, even Frank Lloyd Wright at one point when he was doing work with concrete, He's paid those dues for you. Hey, he's already, people have already been breaking the ice uh, before. You're, you're not the first one to show up having to move the industry forward. Other people have already begun that process for you. So, um, so that is, so there is a little bit of a cost when you step out of the standard, but what happens is the reward is high why we do it the reward is high in the case of frank Gary, again case in point if you don't want to talk money the reward was wealth right you became a wealthy individual he will die a wealthy individual but that's not that doesn't motivate there's people who are not motivated by money money is only one motivation but not the only motivation He's also in the history books and will be remembered forever, right? He, he has a place in human history and he will be there forever, right? So that's not monetary. When you go into a museum and you see your work on the wall, like back here, these works on the wall, when you see the works on the wall, you're, you're, you're made eternal, right? People remember you forever. And falling water over here, Cobos here, over there. You know, it's been hundreds of years and we're still talking, it's been centuries and we're still talking about these people. And students keep going back to these individuals. Why? Because they are our heroes. So, you know, there's other ways to be rewarded in life. Money is just one of them. It's not the only one. There's others. So you got to find your own why on why you're exploring these things. And there's another reason, because whenever you do anything innovative, there's suffering involved. 
right? A different kind of suffering. There's suffering when you do the standard because you can't get to, you can't express yourself. You have to curve back your creativity. When I was a student, I used to be a student in this lab about 20 years ago. I had Frank Gehry curves in my designs. Like, I liked everything was, I came from the world of fine arts and I used to like making very curvy things. I didn't really understand why the architects were making so many boxes. Why not put a curve in it? You know, why, why is everything so square all the time? Like, why can't I have this curvy thing over here? And the professor will come with a ruler. If he caught you doing like a curvy thing, he would slap you in the hand with a ruler. Pain. And I'm not kidding. Pain. And I'm like, what, what happened? I'm like, you can't build that curve. And you know what? Maybe that slap in the ruler made me the man I am today. Because I've been fighting against that slap of the ruler for the last 20 years of my life. Because, damn it, I want the curve, man. I, I want the curve and I want to know how to make it and I want to know how to build it and I want to know how to do it economical. Because I need it to happen. Because the alternative is I have to let it go forever. And I just can't do that. You understand the problem? So, uh, I was talking to my girlfriend about this, and I, I hope you don't feel that this is a sermon, but it needs to be a sermon a little bit, because you need to know the shithole you're walking into in this world. A little bit. What happens is that we have a legacy of pain in this industry. Okay? And then I, you know, I like to address these things on the front end, because you're not going to understand what, when I show you powerful technology, you won't understand why am I showing you such powerful technology when the other people are eating dirt? And you won't understand the disconnect. We have an industry with a legacy of pain. And it's a problem. A lot of people have a hard time stepping out of that standard. Why? Because when they step out of the standard, they've been punished. I was slapped with a ruler, right? A building department may not approve your design or may make you go through extra pain to get it built. Pain. Pain. There's no other word. It's called pain. Okay? Pain in the ass. Pain. Yes. Pain. All right? When you, when you have to sell an idea really hard to a client, there's pain involved. Okay? In the world of CAD, I'm going to talk about one of the first pains that I encountered. When I started going around town showing people, look at the incredible things I can do in Katia, you know, whatever hadn't happened yet. And I met with an architect and I showed him everything we can do. He was like, wow, it's incredible. You know, I'm like, like, oh, well, you know, are we in or are we out? You know, we're we doing something, you know, what's going to happen here? And he's like, you know, what you're showing me is incredible. But I'm going to wait. And I'm like, you're going to wait? What are you waiting for? He said, I'm going to wait to see who wins. Who becomes the standard. Like, right now, there's Archicad, there's Revit, there's Katia. We don't know where the industry is going. And we're going to wait. Wait? You're going to wait? Again, what are you waiting for? He said... I'm waiting for a clear winner. And I didn't know why, I, the moment it caught me off guard, I, I was surprised. I didn't know why that mattered. Like, why do you feel that you need to follow the pack? Why do you have to, don't you wanna be an innovator? Don't you wanna be leading the market? Don't you wanna be ahead of your competitors? Cause I went to school for business. And in business, you have something called a competitive advantage. So, you know, you make a better smartphone to have a competitive advantage over your clients. You build a better screen, a faster phone, whatever, to have a competitive advantage. Nobody is buying a slower phone with bad resolution. Always is running out to buy that, right? You're only going in one direction. It's either better, faster, and cheaper, uh, but not the other way around. So nobody's going to pay more money for a less functioning phone. You know, so... In the world of business, you have a competitive advantage. So I didn't understand why he wanted to be part of the standard. 
So to explain that, I need to tell you what happened in CAD. So you understand the legacy of pain that we have in this industry. Back in the days, and I'm, and I know this because I used to, I'm guilty of doing it myself, right? When I was a student, if the software wasn't AutoCAD based, I didn't want to deal with it. I'm like, nah, that's garbage. Uh, I want a little crappy software. I want to look at it. And I swear to God, I looked at nothing. If it wasn't Autodesk, I didn't want to know about it. Where did, how did that happen? Where did that come from? Why did I even have that perception? Right? And I'll tell you how my perception changed. What happened was the industry had a problem called interoperability. So, for example, there's, um, I, I think it's called the 10th monkey. You ever, ever heard of the 10th monkey? All right, I'll tell you the story of the 10th monkey. Well, first I'm going to drink some coffee. Standard coffee. I wasn't even a latte. Thanks, girlfriend. All right. So, the test monkey. What happens with the test monkey? So, you have a bunch of monkeys in a cage, right? It's an experiment. And you have a banana at the top of the cage. And there's like a little, like, um, like a firefighter pole. They go up and down the pole to get the, the banana. So what, <laughs> so, what happens? Every time a monkey goes up the, the pole to get a banana, the scientists would like put water and wet all the monkeys. They, they would get like splashed with water. So the monkeys would all complain and protest against the monkey that went up the pole to get the banana. They started creating an association that every time a monkey went up the pole, something bad happened to them. Right? They all got wet or electrocuted or whatever. Zapped. So over time, every time they will keep introducing a new monkey into the pot. So you had 10 monkeys in there, we'll take one monkey out and put a new monkey in there. And of course, the new monkey will be all excited. He's like, great, here's a bunch of new monkeys. And there's a banana at the top. And what would the new monkey do? Immediately go up the, the pole to get the banana. And what happened was the other monkeys, they knew what happens when a monkey goes up the pole, they will beat up the monkey who wanted to go up. They're like, no, 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 my monkey, you can't go up the pole. Because if you go up the pole, bad things are going to happen to us and, and we're not going to let you. So the monkey who rebel against the monkey that went up the pole because they were afraid something bad was going to happen to them. Eventually, the, uh, the, the penalty stopped. So the, 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 um, the scientists were no longer zapping the monkeys anymore. So they would introduce a new monkey. And there was no consequence for the monkey to go up the pole and get the banana. He can go up the pole now and get the banana. But because the other monkeys had suffered so much that they will be damned if any monkey at any point was going to go up that pole and go after the banana. Right? They would, they would beat up the monkey. And they didn't even know why. And then little by little, they, start, they started replacing other monkeys out and putting new monkeys in. And the other monkeys will begin um, this decade. They will continue the tradition of beating up the monkey that goes up the pole. And the scientists were baffled because half of the monkeys in the cage were not even there when the electrocutions were happening. The new monkeys. Why? So the new monkeys learned that, hey, monkey going up the pole means we need to beat them up. We don't know why we're doing it. It's just what we do here. All right? Monkey goes out the pole, and we're gonna beat up that monkey, right? So that's the tenth monkey. Um, that's the tenth monkey problem. We have a tenth monkey problem in the building industry. When you start to go out of the standard, because the other cat monkeys, all right, no pun intended, have suffered, and what did they suffer? They suffered interoperability problems, which means. Like, if you are a different monkey and you show up with another software, let's say, like, Bentley Systems or something, all right, or ArchiCAD, you show up with ArchiCAD, and there's a bunch of AutoCAD monkeys over here, the AutoCAD monkeys are like, why are you using this, like, other software, man? And they will beat up the monkey that shows up with the ArchiCAD software or the Bentley software or the any other software that wasn't the other software because they are afraid of retribution from Autodesk. And what do I mean by that? I mean, like, for example, 
if if you are really quite this is happen to me all the time if you're a good engineering firm all right and i'm an architect and you're the best engineer i can hire for this project but you happen to use another software that happens to not be compatible with with my software I start to not want to use you because I'm afraid that we're going to have interoperability problems. And that's going to represent a waste of time and rework for me and for you. So even if you're the best, I might go with Mohammed. He's cheaper and he uses compatible software. So even though you're the best number one choice, sure, hell, you may be even one of the contract. I may even go with Mohammed just for because um, I'm afraid what might happen because of interoperability problems. It's the 10th monkey problem. So the building industry has this 10th monkey problem and there are solutions to it. So when I realized the 10th monkey problem in the building industry, I realized that it's an interoperability problem. So my dealings with the so, because um, I, I, again, I, I talk to the people who make it here a lot. I said, guys, you know, what you have to do is you have to create interoperable software. So if there is a, a, a big monkey, a cat monkey, you need to be able to consume their information without that monkey feeling any pain. If that monkey feels pain, and I don't mean monkey in the regulatory term, term, if that user feels pain, they're not going to be inclined to want to work with you. Right? So... So a couple things have helped that. Uh, one is the IFC code, which allows you to bring BIM models from any vendor into the platform. Uh, Katia supports it. Supports every version of it from 2x3 all the way to 2x4. I think we're at 2x4 and a half now. It also supports um, vendor neutral, meaning that it can read a native, a native Revit file. It can read a native inventor file. It can read models from competitor softwares like for example nx or siemens it can read those in directly into katia without interoperability problems so interoperability problem is a thing that at some point you need to come to grips with because what happens in the industry is while katia the the most powerful standalone platform that i know and there are industries that use it end to end for everything from design to engineering to fabrication to simulation to project management, okay? Our industry is very fragmented. So at some point you may you may have a, a client or a partner that you're working with and you're gonna have to bring in their software into the, your platform so you can continue developing it. I've made a lot of money doing this, guys. Because like, for example, when an architect designs an incredible building, uh, I always feel bad. I'm like, oh, you poor guy. Why? Because he can't take it all the way to the end. So what ends up happening? Because he can't take it all the way in, it's created an entire business opportunity for me to fill in the gap. I've made money filling in the gap. You can't go from point A to point B. Don't worry, I'll take you for your, your one and a half. I'll take it to two, man. Okay, I'm happy you got to one and a half. I'll take it the rest of the way. Perfect. But Katia could have done from one to two directly. So what happens, like, you know, you have an architect that comes up with a very complex, um, let's say, curve wall system or the facade building is really exotic. And let's say they did it in Revit. That's great. When I take that model, I have to, because the intention is not to stop at the model, right? The intention, we're not building a video game. We're building a building. So we have to not just have the model, we have to then take the model and take it all the way to construction, manufacturing, fabrication, and installation, and operations. Right? Because there's components, like for example, you have kinematic architecture, like the like you see in Dubai, where paddles open and close, those are things that move and need maintenance. Otherwise, all the mechanical systems break down over time. So you have operations. Now, because the architect is working in this fragmented world, what happens is you take their design intent and then you have to recreate it. From the perspective, you are now going to take it the other half of the way there. So you take their design intent, so you see what it is that they're trying to accomplish, 
and then you build another model that takes into account constructability, manufacturability, fabrication, and construction assembly. Okay, to get it to the other to the other end. Now, if that architect, I don't know why it would be the right word. If that architect had access, maybe that's a better word, to the tool that you guys are going to learn, they would be able to go end to end without having to do a throwaway model. So, for example, that model that I get from Revit, that current wall is useless to me other than other for me to look at and say, okay, I see what you want to do there. And then and then you create the real model that's going to be used for construction, fabrication, manufacturing, and assembly. So the only thing I'm getting from the architect is his dream, his vision of what he would like for me to accomplish. Um, that's not really what Frank Gehry does. And again, maybe this, again, I, I, I promise you no, no right answers here, just a whole bunch of questions. Why did Frank Gehry have to do something different? Um, because nobody could build these buildings. So Frank Gehry had to expand his roles and responsibilities, which by the way, means more money, uh, more roles, more responsibility means more money. I don't know how else to say it. Should I just say more money one more time? More money because responsibility and money go hand in hand. Does anybody make a lot of money with low responsibility? I don't know that person. Like people who make a lot of money have a lot of responsibility, haven't you noticed? All right, so responsibility and money and risk go hand in hand. The more risk, the more responsibility, the more money. So if you're in a high risk, low money situation you're in a bad business model because high risk and low money what's the justification for that you know like no you can go do something else for low money and so if you're doing high risk it should be high reward connected to it now if the architect understood that he can have a situation where he can have more control of his project so when he does his design intent which you can do in Katia. If you just want to stop at design intent, tell you, look, man, I'm not an engineer. I don't understand manufacturing and fabrication, but I can get it to this point. What happened with Frank, because he needed to explain it to other people and he needed to educate the contractors and the fabricators on what they were going to do, he had to take on more of that responsibility. So he had to take on more responsibility for how his buildings are going to be constructed and he had to answer problems that he didn't know how to answer before like for example when you have a complex structural member how do you how do you bend steel how do you bend steel in a controlled way so it has the right shape and when you take it to the field it fits the right thing so he had to learn all these things that the average architect never has to look at they never the average architect will never look at bending steel or no medically controlled bending but what happened is because Frank was dealing with his comp, remember he had a driver that was pulling it all the way through. His team had to worry about how are we going to build this, right? So they had to take on a higher role and a higher responsibility, which meant they doubled their fees. So if an architecture fee is a uh, 7%, Frank Gary's fee is 14 now, right? And then you have architects crying that they can't get 2%. Well, Frank is getting 14. Why is Frank getting 14? And everybody else is struggling to hold down two. It has to do with stepping out of the standard, right? And taking on more role and responsibility. So what I, again, this course is, uh, it's an accelerated course. We're going to be dealing with everything that's new. I've been doing Katia for over 20 years, okay? I'm not here to teach you the, what happened in the last 20 years. That's not that class. This is, remember, that's going that way. And I know that might be kind of weird because most of your life in school has been about, hey, let's teach you the crap that we did before. And let me pass on the old crap to the new people. No, 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 that, that's not what's happening here. We don't got time for that. The world is changing too fast right now. And I mean, it's 
really, really changing very quickly right now. So what we're doing in this class is we're looking forward. I have a, an extremely strong base in Katia, and I can walk around the parts of Katia that you're not going to know. But in the process of what we're going to be doing in this class, you're going to discover, you're going to discover Katia, and I'm going to fill in the blanks for you. Because Katia is a very powerful software. Katia is like, it is like having Max, Maya, Rhino, Revit all built into one software, including Mastercam. You know, it's all integrated into one mega powerful software. So I'm not here to teach you every single thing that Katia can do. I gave an outline to Miami Dade College for eight classes on Katia. I say, look, man, here's a class on 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 on. on Parametric design. Here's a class on advanced surfacing. Here's a class on structural modeling, steel, concrete, um, rebar, wood optimization. Um, here's a class on IoT connecting the physical building to the virtual building. I mean, here's a here's a class on construction simulation. We can be doing that all semester long. Okay, so I can't cram all that into one course. No one can, and nobody, even if I could. You wouldn't want me to. Your head would be on fire. All right, so we're not going to do that. What we are going to do is we're going to look at two things that are happening, which are important to Katia, but also go beyond Katia. One of them is object-based programming. One. So why are we looking at that? Um, I guess you know what. Let me um, let me open up a, a screen here, so you guys can see what object-based programming looks like. So we're not just talking about it, we can actually look at it and then we'll jump into it. So if we type in Katia AEC. I think any one of these will probably this, this is probably a good one here. One of the greatest capacities of Katia. Is the capability to automate the operation of sub assemblies in a product structure. So, I don't know if you can see my screen. This is a KTM model bridge. Um, actually, not too long ago, I went to see uh, Sahadid's, uh, one of Sahadid's uh, projects. We should design a bridge in the field. It's fantastic. Alright, here in a minute, they should show. Where's the cable? They should show um, uh, the scripting component of Katia. This video is a step by step to learn how to automate the So, if you see this panel system and glass I'm showing here, uh, again, you're seeing some of the tools are in Katia. So, they're they're going to go through developing like this um, interesting panel, which is, again, this is one of the tutorials that we're most likely going to go through um, this class. So, there's a lot to take in, and my job is to take you through these processes so you'll begin to understand how these things happen. All right, so there is some scripting, and again, um, I think this one's probably taking a more traditional form of scripting, which uh, is using something called EKL. I actually, you know what? I actually want to look at a different one. EKL is powerful. EKL is powerful, but I want to show you a different one. Yeah, let me. So I put this one, um, I posted this one. This is actually one of the ones we're going to do. And we want to probably start with this one. So here you're going to see uh, the development of a panel. And they're going to create a user template of a complex uh, complex surface on the model. You'll see here in a second that this uh, gentleman who's modeling, uh, which I think is Nuri Miller, he's going to model um, a really interesting panel that's very hard to do in architecture. So like it folds, it folds in itself. But once he develops the panel, what happens is he's going to create a template from this panel. And this template is parametric, meaning that it has parameters, and those parameters are able to change. So as the panel is applied to a complex surface, for example, the panel is adaptive, meaning that as the surface changes, the panel is going to adjust itself to the to the changing power to the changing conditions of the model. To that line. Now, so now I've got you're going to see a couple of things happening. One of them, um, one, one of these we're going to be covering this semester, 
This is called so subdivision surface model. Okay. Sitting on the surface. So subdivision surface modeling uh, is very intuitive. It's, it's very it's like clay like. It's very easy to come up with complex forms and surfaces and shapes. So now I want to add a line and that's gives you a developable surface that you can then panelize and turn to these kinds of things. And so we're going to be looking at a strategy you know, on how that, that uh, up how they actually go ahead and do that. So this the tutorial that we're currently looking at is walking us step by step. What I'm and going to do as your host is I'm going to recreate going to this tutorial from the perspective I'm going to show you step this. We're going to do it together step by step. Like you can't ask this guy a question, but you can ask me questions. And I can show you um, what he did there. Like any tutorial, they direction. skip steps, right? They assume that you know things. And they they do these quantum leaps and you're like, I don't know where this happened. So, for this as we're doing this research together, there's going to be moments that I'm going to need you to do research. Meaning that you're going to have to do trial and error with me, because I'm doing it with you. And we're going to figure it out. So, don't worry, I've been teaching for, gosh, since, I, since uh, four or five, at least for 14 years. And during those 14 years, all we've been doing with students is research. Right, I... I take you a certain step and then you need to grab the battalion and go a few steps further. And then what we do is we take that knowledge and we share it in the class and then we all collectively know now and we're able to go forward further. And that's, and again, you're going to discover things along the way. And when you do, you're going to share those things with the class. You're like, oh look, I discovered this tool does this and that's fantastic. You'll share it, and our collective knowledge is going to grow. He's right now modeling the panel. So I'm going to go ahead and forward it just a little bit. So you can kind of... Uh, uh, oh, okay. So, so, I'm going to pick so he's starting to work with the panel. And you can see that he's developing the top portion of the panel. And then he's also then going to develop the bottom portion of the panel. They're going to be interwoven. With this fill what happens with this process is the uh, the panel is going to be parametric, meaning that you can change parameters, and so the model will change. This is really powerful be because it creates a situation where each panel can be unique and each panel could be different. So in architecture, we have an issue so like, well, you know, when you go to manufacturing, you go to fabrication, people build the same thing and give you a building block and that building block looks like every other building block and you put them together I'm gonna add a thickness of remember one of the things that we're dealing in this class is we, we're dealing with design freedom so when you need each of those box to be different or unique it easily thickens. now you have a tool like a tia that will make a unique panel in a changing condition so you're going to build a smart model a smart panel for example and then as that panel repeats itself, it's allowed to change. Another thing that happens is that each panel retains its own autonomy, meaning that each panel is independent from all the other panels, meaning that each panel could be modified uniquely. So if you want to go in there and make changes to one particular panel, you can do that. And Kitty will completely allow you to do that. So, all right, so here you're seeing the top portion of the panel. I think he does this thing where he, he copies it somehow um, and develops the bottom side. So I'm just going to fast forward just a little bit. And automatically connect. I create my parametric template. Okay. The other so he duplicated the effort and now he has two um, panels and he's going to shift the angle of one, like the, the guide. And now you have one portion so on the top and one swooping on the bottom side. Now we'll go in the so I think this is an excellent tutorial. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun uh, modeling this. I didn't have and it will begin to uh, give you the basis of how Katia works. So as you're looking at Katia, you're seeing what's on the left, which is called the tree. And you see he has it organized. Um, it's very organized with, with inputs and the different panels and relations. Um, probably the hardest part of Katia historically has been teaching people about the tree. The good news is I've been dealing with it for about 20 years. Okay. So 
I have a, probably as good a grip as anybody there we go. Now anywhere I've, in the world taken when it comes to I've how the to tree is organized and we'll have a conversation on tree. I won't make it too complicated, but basically what happens is the tree is a history of the model. So everything that you do in the model, Katia is what's called a history-based model. So it never forgets anything. Most software can't handle that because most software that's too much data for the model to carry. So what ends up happening, the model, most models lose your historical data. Katia doesn't do that. Katia carries the historical data all the way through. Um, other things you should probably know about Katia, Katia um, supports virtual reality. So if you happen to have a virtual reality headset at home, you can experience your panels in virtual reality at any time. You can toss on a headset and see it in, in VR while you're developing okay so here it goes to that was pretty much just step one there i'm gonna take this he's gonna shift into um, he's gonna then turn that into a template and i'm going to test to so make sure the parameters i'm super excited about this because That's you're going to really get to experience the high end side of katia right so you saw how you changed the numbers on the model parametrically and the model turned red and then updated so That's because the model is a parametric model. This is a true parametric model. Yeah. So this semester so we're going to be doing parametric modeling. So one of the things that we're going to be embracing is what is a parameter. And, and, and how do you apply a parameter? How do you modify a parameter? How do you change it? How many parameters are there? Well, I can tell you in Kadir is probably a couple thousand parameters. Um, for everything from the coefficient of friction all the way down to things like length, area, so building angle. And so on, under tools there is a lot of power features. in these models. So that's where that's and why when I say that Katia is design freedom, which contains all the features, it's design freedom because you can do anything. Formulas. The downside of design freedom is that you can do anything. All the inputs are there, they're automatic. So like what's easy about Revit and Revit, I can say, well, and I'm uh, this is how you model a wall. And great. So that when I Katia says, well, that's a standard sure wall. They'll be there. Don't you want to do a Can unique wall? From black box if you want to build a unique wall, the a wall that no one's ever seen before, right? That you have the intellectual property for. Your, testing. like, it's your now, child. Um, like it's your brain child. Will be the two volumes. Because they can do that. You don't have limitations like that. So you have design freedom. So a lot of software tell you what you, you can't do. They say this is what you can do, and this is what you can't do. Okay, data doesn't have limitations like that. As we expect. You're you're the limitation. So whatever your so however, however your creativity is, however deep your creativity is, temporary it's you. Geometrical. Right. You can go very far with this tool. We're try out this tool is just going to offer you limitless possibility. So it gives us a little preview. But you're the limit. Of so. The the more research you do, the further you're going to be able to go. The more you investigate uh, the process, the, the further you'll be able to do, uh, do this. So basically what you're seeing here, um, you're seeing a model that the inputs have been defined. So for example, the those four edges of the model uh, are basically the edges that are governing the model. So if those edges were to change, the model would reconfigure itself to a different size. Right? With the panel, with the panel. Um, well, you see how he was able to change the parameter, and then the model dramatically changes its behavior based on the change of a parameter. Just now, in keep in mind what's kind of beyond the fact that the, there is a model. Now, what's really important is this model is a fabricatable model, meaning that you can take this piece and you can manufacture fiber casing, C metal, 3D print, anything like that, any any type of technology, anything that exists from the world of advanced manufacturing. Um, a set of panels, it's possible. A set of surfaces. So let me pause for a second. So here, um, this is where 20 years of experience comes in, okay? At no point did you see this person model this. He just showed up with a curved wall. Great. Let's leave out how we got there. All right. And this is why there's a professor in the class. So what happens is he's going to use this curved surface to apply these panels to that curved surface. 
what they're not telling you is that in order for that to actually work those curved surfaces have to be expressed and if those curved surfaces are not expressed you can't apply the model and knowing how to express that took me six months to figure out because there was no one to ask okay years of research so research that you don't have to do so when you get to this point in the tutorial where he is not explaining what he did there i'm explaining what he did there okay so this is where we look back in the history of modeling over the last 20 years and we pull back knowledge from the back and we bring it forward so you guys can receive it and go forward because you don't got time to do the last 20 years of my life you need the information now so you can take it now and go forward all right otherwise i'm wasting your time and you don't have time to waste technology I have an opinion about what's happening in, in education right now. We, we can't call it teaching anymore. This, I, let's call this an accelerator program. I am here to accelerate you, not to teach you. I'm here to spin you as fast as I can and send you out there because you don't have 20 years to learn what I learned. You don't have it. There's no point in you repeating my 20 years of experience to start today. So I have to accelerate you so you can start from here today and not have to go through 20 years of history to start class. All right, so I call this an accelerator program for that very reason, right? So let me uh, go ahead and um, start the process so you can kind of see where we're going with this. Um, that are very different from the original context we created. So you see here, he made a, he's inputted the object. Uh, it's a little hard to see. He has two tabs yeah, open. Right? So he has his inputs. Input curves. And those inputs are basically lines. And um, he's defining um, the lines on that on that surface. Can do it multiple times. He's picking them. He's picking them. And we're just gonna Once he's go done doing that, a couple, a few more times. it's interesting because he's doing this manually. So there's like a manual we'll process to this. So he's going one by one. We have a few, and as he's uh, doing that, and the panel is being adapted that, to the uh, changing conditions of the model here. So it's, it's being like adapted to the surface. If we instantiate it, so by the time he's done, you can see the exotic surface he just created. An entire Man, I live and die for this stuff every day. So it's that by it's itself clean. is enough to errors. change you as an architect and put you 10 years or 20 years ahead of the curve of the industry. Right, that, right there. You don't have to do anything else. Different context. Like, if that surface was on the surface of a building in South Beach, that's a famous architect. Right there. You don't have to go, you don't have to go do the anything step. else. You don't have to go any further than that. Look at the skeleton. Remember, that we've created, you're not just modeling it. And you're going to be taking it into the world of, ma of making, like which has always got me excited because all my other fellow architects can't make it. They can't take it all the way in and... and some of them may even argue, why should I? You know, why should I know more than just my piece of it? Um, because, man, sometimes, uh, again, if you can't control this process, what ends up happening, people will tell you that you can't do it. So we have a surface, uh, or it's going to be too expensive, or they don't know how. You gotta, you gotta help them along. You have to fill in the blanks, and you gotta bridge the gaps, like right, between the world of design and the world of manufacturing. So I'm going to stop here for a second. I want you to look at the image on the left. The image on the left is what we're going to be researching this semester. This is what's called object-based programming. If you have ever seen this before, um, there's other software that do it too. Like for example, real popular software is a, a tool called Grasshopper, which introduced this kind of object-based programming. Autodesk, um, also developed something called um, Dynamo, which is object-based program. Now, wh why do I, I mention this? So, when I was a student, architecture was taught pen in, pen in hand, right? So when you wanted to do a curve, what you do, you got the pen and you went like this. 
doing like that. And your brain understands that. That's not what we're doing anymore. So now you have to have this idea in your mind and you have to find other ways to express that in the computer. Ways, there's a new language of tools that have completely departed from the table. You see that table, the drafting tables in front of you? We've departed 100%, meaning we're not drawing. You can draw on Kitia and you'll, again, this class is not long enough for me to show you all the ways you can even do you can even draw lines and you can take them you can take um you can take a, a virtual reality tool like like um like hcc vive for example or any any headset and use the controller to draw lines in space you can do that in katia you can do that in katia right now um but from what i've been seeing in the industry and i've been looking at a couple of different tools that are very powerful there's a few things that you need to know. One, the Unreal Engine 5 entered the building industry. Anybody seen the Matrix uh, Resurrection? All right, so if you saw the Matrix movie, that's a virtual model of a city. And it looks real. And you can't tell it apart from a real city. So why does the gaming industry have better models than the building industry? That's, that's a problem. For me, anyway. So, I like what I can do in Katia, and I want to combine what I do in Katia with with the, with the gaming industry, so we can take full advantage of all the tools that the gaming industry has, which are very, very powerful. I mean, really powerful. Okay, which the gaming industry it's kind of like it's a, it's a, it's stupid to call it the gaming industry at this point because. But it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, your smartphone, we still call it a phone. Is it really a phone? It's kind of bubble. Well, we still call it a phone um, because we talk through it. But, but we probably text more than we talk and, you know, we look at the Internet and we use it to, we use it for everything, right? To guide our cars and figure out where we are. You know, it's, just, it's a multi-purpose device. The gaming industry is being used for Hollywood. Is being used in, in movies, productions, and it's incredible. It's being used in renderings, in animations, and an interactive virtual reality. Okay, so that interactivity that is coming from the gaming industry is fantastic. So, if you can combine the modeling capabilities of Katia, which takes you into the world of construction, fabrication, and manufacturing with the world of advanced visualization coming from the gaming industry, I think that that is such a powerful combination. That is so powerful that it's stupid, man. It's so powerful that you fall off your ass powerful. Like, rocks are wet and the water looks like ocean, the sand looks like sand, dirt looks like dirt, there's bugs crawling on stuff. I mean, um, one of the problems we've always had with models is that they look perfect. Um, you can take a model, bring it into the Unreal Engine, and add, make it look like it's been through hell and back. You know, you can take a spaceship and it looks like it's been in space for two million years, and it's been aged, and it looks cr like cruddy and falling apart and corroded and like. Sometimes you need that, right? That might be the look that you're looking for. Um, and I would say in architecture, you're looking at things like you need trees, you need birds, you need landscapes, you need models of scale of entire cities, you know? So the gaming industry allows you to cross a bridge. So guess what? The gaming industry is using object-based programming, like the one I'm showing you here. The one that they never teach you in school, okay? So object-based programming is not part of an architect's um, education. But that's a horrible mistake, and I'm in the process of trying to explain to Miami Dade College, we can't do this anymore. Um, it doesn't matter what software they, they have to begin to look at it. Even if you were to stay with, like, say, out of the spots, 
Uh, Visual Studio Max now has object-based programming in it. Adobe just bought a company called Algorithmics, and the textures and materials that they're doing is so powerful, they, and they're indistinguishable from reality. Object-based programming. Okay, so in three applications that we're going to use this semester, one being Katia, and uh, this tool is called External, by the way. It's going to look at object-based programming. We're also going to look at uh, another tool called uh, Substance from Adobe, which does incredible textures, object-based programming. We're not going to be able to get to the Unreal Engine, but I want you to know about it. Because what you're doing with scripting, it's, you need to begin to become comfortable with it. And I know it's painful. I'm 46 years old. Most of my, my co-mates that I went to school with, they don't want to learn anything new. But the problem is, all the tools I'm changing and showing you, they're hitting the industry really hard. What's going to happen to them in five years? They're going to be right back where you are, saying, I don't know how this got away from me. Because things are not going in a straight line towards the top. I wish it was that way, straight line towards the top. Um, things are doing really weird things where they're quantum leaping right now. So you may have 20 years of Katia, and I'm not here to teach you my 20 years of Katia because things are quantum leaping. So I need to bring what's valuable from the past, bring it forward as quickly as I can, but marry you with what's happening right now so those two worlds intersect. My job is to show you how the past connects to the future. And that's it. How the past connects to the future, man. So we're going to be looking at object-based programming for, for what we're going to be doing in this class. How are we doing in time? I'll just check real quick. Keep an eye on things. All right, so ultimately, I'm going to fast forward to this. You're going to be heading out, Mohammed. So, Ex in external. I want to show you real quick what happens. So, so you're looking at object-based programming. Surface, and we divide. I, and in this tutorial that we're looking at, this is probably where we're going to begin with this process. So you see on the right, he has broken down a surface into a bunch of panels. That surface is not just a surface. That surface is a subdivision surface. It's a sub D surface. Okay, it's parametric and it um, can be easily and quickly deformed. So you're sure seeing how that way. model went to that surface so and then was able to extract different points on the, on the geometry of the model and so was able to also put a um, an access system on each get, panel, which helps you with the orientation. From the bottom, because when you go through, when you apply so a complex model to a surface, set of curves going so cheap right software direction. doesn't know if you want it this right way or that direction. way. So you need an access system to orient the model so it knows which way is north. So once we especially when you have a changing condition like the one that he has here. Okay. So in this tutorial, he didn't really show you how he got to his tree on the left. So we're going to have to stop the video and look at it and working all of us together. And actually know these people so I can call them on the phone if it really came down to it. Say, what did you do here, man? All right, so I'm going to pause here for a second. The subdivisional surface. Let me take it one step, one little step back. This is all because things change and you don't know what you're looking at yet. So, so once if I pause here for a second, I want you to notice that the the top of the screen here, he's not on a version of Katia that's installed on the computer. He's running on the cloud. And this is something that you need to know a little bit about. So what's happening? So for the last 20 years, when I wanted to build a complex model of a building, a skyscraper, an airport, whatever, I was working on a computer like this one. Okay. What is starting to shift, and I have a client right now, the Miami International Airport is my client. And I'm selling them an airport in their pocket. Meaning that everything that's happening on the airport, the design, the construction, the engineering, the simulation, the work orders, the project management, 
it's all on their smartphone. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because Katia is not a software application. It's a platform. And that platform is running in the cloud. So what you're going to discover soon in this class is that you're going to be able to go on a date, pull out your phone and say to your, you know, to your date, look at my new building. You want to see it? You're going to be able to flip it around in 3D. And they're going to say, wow, how is that possible? Yeah, there it is. My entire building on my smartphone. You want to go through it? You want to fly through it? Want a different perspective? Want to play with it? So you'll be able to do that. Why? Because that model is not on your phone. That model is running on the cloud. So Katia is a cloud infrastructure that is going to put an entire airport in your pocket. Not just the model, the entire process from designing, constructing, operating, owning, the entire asset from end to end can be and will be in your pocket. So what you're starting to say, so that doesn't, so that, that, that's a consumer perspective, right? I have an airport, I have an airport, and now I want to look at it on my phone, great. That's not what we're doing here. What I'm showing you is that you can design the airport on your smartphone. And that's what you're looking at here. The scripting tool on the left, that's on a web browser. The model on the right, that's on a web browser. Now, does that mean that you're never going to open it up on a rich client? No, it works interchangeably between the rich client, which is installed on your computer, and the cloud infrastructure, which runs on any device anywhere in the world. So if you were in New York and you were on a subway on your way to work, you can be working on the model on your tablet computer, parametrically changing the model and reworking the design. And by the time you get to the office, the new design is available to everybody who's working on the project. All right? Or you can be at the beach or under a tree or wherever you want, man. You know, today we've been spending a lot of time with ourselves. You know, we've been hanging around parks, you know, hiding around building corners. Wherever you want to be happy. You want to go sit at the beach and work on your tablet and be by yourself. and Great. Go do that. But you know what? While you're being by yourself under that tree, your entire team, wherever they are in the world, back in the office or at home working remotely, they're connected to everything that you're doing. And they can see it. Okay? So that's what's happening here. And I, I got to flesh it out because at face value, you don't know that. You're just seeing a model, but you don't know what's happening behind the curtain. That's what's happening behind the curtain. Into and that's why this stuff is crazy, man. Into these buckets of these inputs. So now that you can see it's on a web browser, bottom curve, side and curve. you have this parametric model on the so, left side that's controlling everything. Okay. We're going Let me to, see what he does um, next. This is all. He's still on the web browser. Right? If we want all right, so you're, you're seeing the web-based uh, interface of modeling Katia. Now, I'm going to pause it real fast here. Ah, jeez. Take one step back. I want to show you that he's going to do something. So that if we wanted to he's going to shift environments real fast, but now I want to show you the environment. Is, okay, let me pause there. So, these are the new tools that work on a browser. So, if you want Katia on the cloud, Katia in the cloud, um, are these tools like X Design, X Mall? These, these are Katia running in the cloud, like X Frame. We're talking about doing structural modeling on a tablet computer, and it doesn't matter if it's an Android. How many of you have anybody have Android? If you have any, well, an Android device, or if you have an Apple device, you can still do it either one. It doesn't matter because it's going to the web browser. Now, this tool called X Shape. I need to say something about it. X Shape is subdivision surface modeling on the cloud does it, do you guys know what that means do you know what subdivision surface modeling is yet no so subdivision surface modeling is is similar to like doing a clay sculpture you start with either a plane or a ball and you 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 deform that until it turns into the 3d printer over there okay you push and pull it and you work the surface in a very sculptural way to arrive at the form so these are tools that the architects don't get to play with that often. Uh, there are other exceptions. Like the, some people use um, Rhino, for example, does subdivision surface modeling. Uh, I think 
Siemens NX also does subdivision surface modeling. Encadia does subdivision surface modeling. And I think, I'm not sure, I believe the Maya does as well. Okay? So, if tomorrow you end up with just Maya, what you learned in Katia and subdivision surface and modeling will apply there. If you ended up with Rhino, you will have a deep understanding of what that is. If you went to another company and used NX Siemens, you would you would know what you're doing with it. Okay. In Katia, what makes it different than everybody else is that it's connected to everything else. So while right now it might be a standalone software, and then when you're done doing your subdivision service model, you have to export it to another software like Katia to continue developing it. In Katia, you have it integrated front and back, which means, and I always have a big problem with this. I'm sure you guys heard of SketchUp before, right? A lot of people do a design in SketchUp, and they, they sell the project to a client on SketchUp. They design it, they develop it in SketchUp, they show it, the client finally is in love, and guess what they do with that model? They basically throw it away. And then they start over in another software like Revit and then do the the real building. Okay. The problem with that is that the, the, there's a, I'm going to say something that you may maybe never heard before. It's called digital continuity. And digital continuity is something that I've been working on for a very long time. That means that from your design constant stage, right, from your, from your beginning, you're going to take a model from that design concept stage and take it through every phase of project development in a connected way. What does that mean for you? That means that you can go to your earliest idea about what the project was and change it, and that change will transmit itself all the way to the end of the process. From the beginning, then we're talking about two years, five years, ten years. Okay, how, how long an airport can take two years in design? All right, so whatever you did day one on the job, you can go back and change it in the middle of construction, go back to day one, change it, and update it to, to where you are in the construction schedule five years later. Okay, that's powerful stuff, man. It's crazy, but that works only because there's digital continuity from your design concept phase to construction manufacturing simulation operation phases right that digital continuity is critical and it's something that the world doesn't really understand right why because in the construction industry in the standard there is no digital continuity it's broken pieces all the way through as a matter of fact when i was a young guy like you guys I felt like I would like I'd be like I'm the man because I knew five or six different softwares. They were all broken, but I knew how to make them work together. And because I knew how to weave them together, that's how I had a competitive advantage in the market because I knew how to make them interoperate. Okay? And then one day I realized, you know what, this is stupid. Like how many programs am I going to go through? I'm already going to get eight or nine, you know? I was like, I used to, like, to get a piece of geometry from one application, I would jump in nine applications. Convert to this, convert it to that, convert it. I had a whole map. Well, we convert to this, and then we convert to that, and we we'll bring it to the other program, and then export it as this, and come on, man. Stupid. Right? I felt proud that I had this really crazy map of how you move any geometry from any software to another software, but you were jumping all over the place. I would use Rhino as a translator. I wouldn't use Rhino as a software to do anything. The only thing I would do is to bring in geometry from one platform, convert it to something else, and bring it into something else. That's, that's the world of interoperability. So that digital continuity, when you do that, it becomes disconnected because every time you do a translation you divorce yourself from the original information which makes the old information obsolete and it gets tossed so I'm not in the business of throwing away models because they're expensive to do and it's a waste of time so I can't do stupid man uh, how about, I don't know about you, when someone asks me to do, do you like doing something stupid? 
I have a knee-jerk reaction to doing stupid. Even if they're paying me. Even if you pay me to do stupid, I have a hard time doing stupid. I can't do it. I have a hard time doing it. I just can't. Even, even if I was making money, I don't feel good doing stupid. I'm always trying to do it better, faster, right the first time. Even if you pay me to do it wrong three times and you're going to pay me more money to do it right the third time, I'll be like, why don't we just do it right the first time? Maybe give me a bonus. No, we need to rethink this working stupid process. So I can't do stupid. Right? So when you're looking at the screen, um, there's a tool in Katia that's called Imagine Shape. And Imagine Shape is the one that does the subdivision surface modeling. However, in the cloud infrastructure version of Katia, right, there is this new tool called XShape that, that does subdivision surface modeling on a web browser. So you have two versions of it. You have a rich client, meaning it's installed on your computer, and you have a cloud version of it that runs on any device. The two are interoperable, meaning that if you, let's say you got tired of working on your tablet, okay, and you get to the office, you can open up the same model that you were working on a tablet and continue working on the rich client with no loss on data and no loss of, no loss of functionality. So that's what you're looking at. That's why I wanted to stop here. To the original. All right, so he opened up uh, the X shape, right? So that is the model. He's opened up on a cloud browser. Okay, so you're seeing what the model looks like in the cloud browser. And everything we've laid on top of it. All the tools are on the bottom. And then here on the left is the entire history. This is what we call in Katia the tree. So all the history of everything that's been done lives on the tree. And we select a point. So anything that's there can be modified. Just like digital clay. And brought forward when you need to kind of work with it. We're going to, uh, we can. So what you're seeing here is basically he put a, he put the um, the what's called the gizmo on the geometry, and he's now going to pull that point some distance. You see, and when he pulls that point, what's going to happen? The, the surface geometry is going to deform. And you can see it's bulging. Okay. Surface is kind of so pushing. He, the point's been moved, and his until he clicks this little green checkbox here. So the geometry is an update, the elements I laid on and the model basically um, gets completely updated. So it'll take a second to process. So what you're looking at, the geometry basically updated, but all the control points that were connected to that model, they all updated. So you now have um, every panel now is different, right? So the panels are on the, on the surface may be kind of flat, and the ones that get towards the center of the model are going to be more curvy because of the change in geometry. So now that he has this current subdivision surface model, okay, he's then going to go back to his template over here. You see, he called it GDSD, uh, Clover Leaf template. We need to set up. He's going to go there and he says new. I'm so going to call case, it a template. He's going to do some weird things here. He's going to make a template object and create or a plate. Type. Um, there's the the plate number. And All right, so each instance has a sure to to unique. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause right here because he does something really. Oh, sorry, I'll go back for a moment. Into I want to show something the on that. itself. We need the UDF that we created originally. The panel UDF. We're gonna make sure yeah, I'm gonna take it a little bit further back. And create a plate. All right, type. so here you're looking at a couple things. One, you have the title. The title is the way that is human language. So there's two languages happening here. There's computer language and there's human language. You might call this, you know, panel number one. Katia has its own numbering system. So if you look or it says the name, it says AACT and then it says R1132 and has a bunch of numbers and it ends up with a whole bunch of zeros and ends up with number 76. All right. What happens is that Katia is keeping track you know, like for example, Katia does a lot of things that you've never done before. Most of you are going to be familiar with something called a file-based system. So you have like a Windows file, you do a file save as, you give it a name and it stores on your computer, right? That's not what happens here. So what happens here is that Katia is separated what you call it from what Katia sees. So each, each object has a unique identifier connected to the geometry. So you can call it Frank. 
all you want, but Katia knows is the real number is ARC, and then the, the dash R is the server instance in the cloud where that geometry lives. And then the last number are the unique identifier numbers assigned to that geometry. So even if you call it Frank three times, Katia won't care because it knows that it's, Frank isn't just what you're calling it. Has nothing to do with the real number. Does that make sense? Uh, when you, when you're working with a file-based system, if you if you went file save as and you gave it the same name, it's going to tell you, do you want to overwrite the one that's on the computer? And you're like, no, and then you have to change the name, right? So you don't accidentally overwrite the file. That's not what's happening here. You can call it the same thing all you want. The name is being governed by what's called the product instant. Uh, the um, the Katia Nordic name is, is not a number you can change. It's automatically assigned by the computer. But if you want to call it something, then that's title. You can call it something. But name is handled directly by Katia. And you can give it a description. Now, the next thing he does, and yeah, after he, he gives it a name, I'm going to pause there. The type of the product instantiation method. This is how it's being repeated. Oh, I thought I had it projected here. It's adaptive, meaning that it can adapt to changing conditions. Guys, you need to understand that what we're going to cover this semester took me 20 years ago. This adaptive ability, I've been in the pursuit of it for 20 years. Don't take it for granted. It's not easy to come by. And you're not going to find, I hate to say it, unfortunately, you're not going to find too many professors that are ever going to talk to you about these things. Okay? The stuff is on the bleeding, hard, cutting edge. So adaptive models are extremely powerful. And you're going to, by the end of the semester, come hell or high water, you're going to have an adaptive model. All right, you're going to know how to do everything that we're covering in this class, and you're taking that with you. All right, and I expect you to continue to develop it. But it's an adaptive model, and it's and it's powerful because without it, you can't do this automation and this distribution. One of the things that we're covering in class is how do you automate in the building industry. Okay, so you are the reason we're one of the reasons we're scripting is because we're automating, but we're automating in a way that creates generative designs that are unique, where instead of you modeling every single component one by one, you set up the rules so each one's change according to how you want the model to change. So you are an architect, a designer of change. You are the author of the change and how you allow it to change and how you control that behavior, that's you. That is how you express your creativity. So you need to learn how to do that. And to learn to do that, we want to have to develop a new language that I don't know. We got to learn how to speak that object-based programming code so we can begin to learn how to communicate. And we're going to suffer through it this semester. Remember, suffer through it as we start to get there. And we will get there. That's Make sure it. to set it to adaptable because we want this to be All right, an so adaptable panel. Now that that's been done, he now is going there. He's going the, to define the model. Uh, user defined feature. All right. There's a user type. He's going to pick the. He's going to go pick the geometry from the tree. The panel UDM. This now um, starts to become part of the template, and you can see the template has been loaded there. Once we've done that. Right, so now that the template has been loaded, go I think the next thing context. he's going to then do is going to then uh, apply it to the then geometry. Set up the parametric skeleton. What is in here? And so here he's in the rich client. So this is not um. This here Alex. is notice there's no web address on the top. This is actually the version of KT that is installed on the computer. So I'm going to go ahead and click play, play on that. So you can see all of the inputs are broken out in multiple. So he's going to go find that instance. He's going to go find it. He found it. Created that that new. He's going to pick it. Panel type. 
We're gonna pick. Choose and then he's gonna begin the process of applying. And select from select pattern. Axis. And there's a, the the files have been published. Set up in our external design workflow. And, and there are the inputs. The input so the inputs are kind of automated. So he's going to like feed it a little bit. The bottom. There's different right. curves that he's picking. Right. Uh, so each one of those published are curves. curves. Edge curves. See input surface, input curve. All those are um, those are so all published curves that have been. Done that, um, they've been basically published. Meaning they've been outputted. Basically, what that means. The specification. These specification objects. So once it goes through the whole thing. Um, which will allow us to automatically. And then here are the parameters. So each each panel has its own parameter. So you can say that every single panel there in the system has the panel, the parameters express, and you can go in there and add any one of those parameters. We can specify the parameters that are set. But the important thing is to know that those panels were created and they're available and they exist. So go up a level. And specify the level of detail, level of development, I should say. We can expose those features. All right, so he's now writing the script. User-defined features. And the model is being generated. This, was, this is how a generative design gets done. Will you see what a big departure this is from the traditional process? Apply those. This is stuff that Miami Day doesn't understand. User-defined features we created. And it's painful. And again, if they don't go through a process like this, they just don't know. Do it. Now that it's done, so what you're seeing is how these things are being created. The, so now he's going to turn off the reference, the skeleton, and, and there you the are. Results. It looks like we've done a fine job of getting these panels to follow what do you this think? changing surface. That's assignment number one. So that's what we're going to be working on. Um, the next couple of weeks. You know, and again, not too long because we have to. Um, the single adaptable model. We gotta get through it. So again, remember, CATI is a tool that's based on industry processes. So here you can see um, kind of the state of the model and the and its process. This is like a web. Okay, now notice he's on a web browser. Let me pause for a second. He's on a web browser now. So this is you on a date with your significant other. And now you're gonna show your model. Look at what I did in class, you know, with Professor Kant's crazy class. And they're gonna be able to see it on any device, including virtual reality. Again, if you have virtual reality at home, you can put it on your grandmother and she can look at it in 3D, you know? They're, they're full complexity. But you're seeing it now, the same geometry that I just told about, that I was telling you about, you can now see it on a web browser. One, just a flat surface with all of the units. And remember, this this is not happening on your device. You it's being generated in the cloud, but you're able to see it in the cloud. So there so are things about the infrastructure, options. and here they're showing you Which some of the project development space. stages. Again, Kitty is a very powerful tool uh, from a project management perspective. So it um, can show you. So there's a like new architecture of technology you have to discover. So when you that, have this much information on a mobile device, on a tablet or a laptop, there has to be ways to, for you to um, be able to consume that information. Show a design so that's in Katia and the rich client, some of those things are more integrated directly to the, uh, the geometry. But what happens when you're running on the cloud, you need and another solution that expands and contracts so, so you can see the information you need and be able to open and close it. Option. Because there's so much information that you need a new methodology to be able to consume this information. So there are some new things that you have to discover, like how do you put an airport in your pocket? There are new things that you have to learn about that you've never seen before. So you notice that they shifted the geometry and the model basically updated. In addition, we can also see so, in um, that's in uh, Katia. Th this is a portion of what we're going to be exploring uh, this see, semester. Uh, examine the different and I think ultimately I'm going to, well, he's almost at the end. In the I think at the end what he does, he takes this definition, then he applies it to a building, and there we're golden. We can also All right? And Powell, the semester's over. Right? 
at the scale of a building. So here he is uh, in the context of a building. So here we have. So you have like a complex surface of a building could be could be the one I didn't think of over here. You know, so it was kind of something similar. As a subdivision. And you work with the geometry. You get the form you want. And we've divided it up. And then after you're done, you apply. You see how you subdivided the surface. Same way we subdivided the little example. All right, each one of those. Uh, each one of those systems are like unique and independent of each other. And we can apply And then he applied the yeah. panels to it. The building scale. And now you're a world famous architect. We can see the variation and how it works at that scale. Viewed from inside. So that's that's what I got that's what I have in mind for the semester. Um, we're gonna be doing some We've also added we're gonna be doing some interesting things with the uh, with the geometry. And look at how it's a process to get there. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's a process, but it's a process that we're gonna do it together. No one, you know, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus here. We're all going to do it together. Uh, I don't know. Again, there's a team of people coming from uh, from Italy. And we can see how much we're gonna be looking at the engineering side of this. Like for example, here you can see some analysis. I'm um, showing you the deformation of the model. Can see that it's so, KT is again, KT is a very powerful tool. So the tool does not just, remember, KT is not just design. It's not design intent only. It includes design intent, but it goes all the way to construction, manufacturing, fabrication. Even so it lets you go the full gamut. Does that mean that you have to do the full gamut? No. You so could if you want to. But you can also work with other people who have expertise in other areas who don't have to recreate your model to do, let's say, a structural, like you can hire a structural engineer, they don't have to recreate your model, they can take your model and do the engineering to your model. Does that make sense? I, I always have a problem when the engineer has to create another model to do the engineering. All Why can't you use my model? How do I know that my your model is, is, represents my model? Able to Why don't you just use my model? To a variety of iterations so, and in the case of Katia, wall, what happens is that the geometry can then be used for everything that comes after, whether the after is engineering, from simple um, beginnings, simulation, manufacturing, or construction. In the cloud. It, it can be, it can, you can continue to use it. So, all right. So that's um, that's kind of like my my baseline of where we're at. Let me um, I wanna I wanna go ahead and open up Katia. Let's see how do I get rid of this? Something no, I'm gonna stop that. I'm gonna open up a new browser. All right, so. So I need you guys um, to get Katia. So if you haven't gotten Katia, let's uh, let's look at it real quick. So Academy. three ds dot com is the the Soft Systems website, and here you can see Get Software. We can go straight there, but I want to show you what the website looks like. All right. There's a lot of resources. There's a lot of resources in the um, in the academic site. Okay. Um, there may be tutorials and things like that. Um, they're there. When you register with the Salt Systems, you see here how it says connect here in the corner. Um, everything's connected to your profile. So once you establish your profile, it's called the 3D passport. That's used for everything. Everything. Right, that's like they call your password because it identifies you within the system. So, for example, things that you let me give you an example because I got, I'm just full of examples. What happens because the world is fragmented, they don't know how to manage your information because there's no data continuity. You see how it all ties together? So, what happens it is not like that because you have an identity, a 3D passport. Katia knows what you modeled, what you did, where you logged in for, what geometry is yours, what you modified, what projects you're working on, who you're working with, blah, 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 so forth and so on, right? Which 
when you want to, here's a crazy concept for you, you ready? When you want to co-author things that we don't want, so, so we have a problem in school. School teaches you to work on your great genius project by yourself. The bad news is the real world doesn't work that way. Yes, you can be a genius and I want you to be, but people who get buildings and built are not building them by themselves. You have to work with other people. Whether you want to or not, you have to work with other people. And other people are going to make contributions. So school doesn't represent reality in that sense, right? And we suck at collaboration in school. When, you know, you try to collaborate with somebody, there's always three people who do nothing and like two do all the work. So we need to get better at the world of collaboration. Because in the real world, when you make things, people are on payroll, they really have to pull their weight, right? So things are made by multiple people co-authoring, co-contributing. Because Katia manages those relationships, it allows me to use what's called one version of the truth. Meaning that I can make a structural column, and again, we have structural engineers, which thank God, God likes me. Thank God we have structural engineers in the class. We can make a model, and we can transfer the intellectual property, the IP, to another receiving party, who can then inherit that model, they don't have to start over again, and they can then do their work on your model, right? And KT is keeping track that you have your version of the model up to a certain point of development, and then it keeps track that that model was transferred to somebody else and that somebody else received it and continue developing. So if you want to know who has a liability for that model, you can see who the last responsible party having access to the model and changing the geometry and working on it and developing you know who that is you know who's accountable but that is only true because there's an information management server on the back end that is managing all of those complex relationships that's why it is not just a little simple small piece of little software there it's big boy big boy big girl tools right this is heavy serious not fooling around tools for people who really want to do something in this world, not thinking about it, not dreaming about it, not imagining themselves doing it, doing it. The real deal. That is Katia. That being said, you have something called a 3D, um, a 3D password. I'm going to log into mine by clicking this connect here. And you'll see what that looks like. So there's my username and my password is invisible. I'm gonna log on to the platform for a second. So I'm logged in, but I'm still on the website. So the website is using my uh, ID to identify me. You can see my credentials at HC, it knows who I am, okay? So I can come down here, um, and you're gonna see there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff. There's always interesting stuff to look at. On the top, you're going to see um, Get Software, okay? You click on get software and again lots of interesting things to get distracted by and I welcome you to poke around as much as you like all right where where you need to know where to go is here where it says three experience Katia for students all right so I like to say something about this um, because it's something I've been working on for years I know I keep repeating myself right years I've been working on getting access to Katia for the majority of my professional career starting from the times I used to work in Royal Caribbean back in 2000 to 2022 that's 22 years in pursuit of this that's a long commitment man. okay if I would have had a if I would have had a child when 20 years ago he would be 22 years old he would be sitting next to you in this room now you'd be a grown man thinking about getting married or something. Big guy, all right? 22 years is a long time. It's a tool that's not easy. It's not easy to have access to. It's hard, okay? So what I'm giving you is a way for you to have access. I consider myself one of the access points of Katia in the building industry specifically. I'm one of the people who advocates for it. One of the people who educates uh, for it, I'm one of the people who builds buildings in the world with it. I'm not dreaming about it. 
I have built buildings. You can go to Lincoln Road and touch the Nero Symphony. I built that. Okay, that was a $289 million project. Um, the one in Lincoln Road was a little bit smaller. It was like $10 million was um, the anthropology store. Um, but I'm using it in the airport. That's, a 200, that's another $200 plus million dollar baggage handling system. These are big projects. So I'm, I'm real about what I'm telling you. So what happens, access is critical. In the past, access, access has always been very controlled and still is very controlled by the software. They don't just hand the software, right? Because it's not commodity software. They're not trying to be the standard and give it to everybody. They don't do this. I know other software companies do that. They don't because they're not trying to be the standard. Remember my conversation, why we began this whole weird conversation about standards? They're not trying to be the standard. I wish if they woke up one day and said, you know what, we're going to become the standard of building industry, they would destroy this industry. They would knock out every competitor on the market, would have to file for bankruptcy. The Associates is one of the world, most well-funded companies in the world, worth at least $13 billion. They... They haven't even suffered any of the economic recessions that we've had. Why? Because they're funded by the military. They are connected to military money. They don't, their numbers don't even twitch, man. Other people, their numbers go like this. This all's like, no problem. Not even in the economic recessions that they even did. Not even a little bit. You see this little thing that just happened with COVID? The all system, no problem. It didn't happen. Not financially. What does that mean to you? It means it's an extremely well-funded technology that is always innovating. It's always growing. It's always changing. And everybody else is trying to follow what they do. So this puts you on the cutting edge. My problem was, if you came to my class and Miami Day bought licenses, they would license the class, they would license the lab. And remember, those licenses are not assigned to the computer. They're assigned to you as an individual. What happens when you leave Miami Day College? Lights out. You disconnect it. Why? Because you left the institution. And the institution owns and controls those licenses. They're assigned to you as a student, but once you walk out of here, this is not the end of the road. You don't walk out of here and you're done. Some people walk out of here and they're done. Other people go to schools and they continue and they go get other masters, PhDs, whatever. They continue. The good news of what this is is that now you'll be able to buy the license for $60. So if I click here, you'll be able to get this license for $60. You see? And you're you're basically getting all the tools that we need. You're getting a lot of technology. Among them is what's called 3D Innovator for Student. And they got Collaborative Business Innovator, which is all the infrastructures, the platform. Yeah, all these um, all these different tools. I'll, I'll tell you all about it, but you click on them. Sixty bucks gives you a year. So, for example, let's say that you you're done with memory data after two years, and you decide to go to FIU or University of Florida. Before, if University of Florida didn't buy Catia licenses, you're out. So, if you got there and said, and that happened to me when I went to Stevens Institute of Technology. When I went to Stevens, I went there in the pursuit of, of Katia because they were a technology school. And as soon as I got there, first thing out of my mouth is, where can I get my Katia? And I found out the hard way. They said, well, you know, uh, we can't let you use Katia here because we have an agreement with Autodesk that if you use Katia, um, we lose our licenses. And now this gives us all of our licensing for free. But we have to make sure that Katia never gets in here. And you don't know all the curse words that came out of my mouth after that. All right? Because an academic institution can't do that. You can't create a situation where I, as a student, don't have access because it's not convenient for you. I don't care if it's convenient for you. You know? Why am I being held hostage? Because you have some backdoor deal with Autodesk. You know? So, so that happens. All right? And so the good thing is, this way, that Katia license follows you. So even if the institution doesn't have Katia, doesn't matter. That software and all the technology follows you, 
and all your work that you did in this campus or any other campus you go to is on your server. So to explain a little bit what happens behind the scenes, KT is a tool that's built around, it's hard to say, it's not built around people, which sounds funny. It's built around organizations. It's built around corporations. So corporations own their intellectual property. Boeing owns building Boeing airplanes. Lockheed Martin owns building Lockheed Martin airplanes. Augusta Westinghouse builds helicopters. Ford builds cars. They own the intellectual property for the things they make. And, they, and, and if you're Ferrari, you build a model of your Ferrari, you don't want no one stealing your Ferrari and building a cheap version in Korea or something, okay, or China. You want to protect your intellectual property. If you're a Bugatti, right, if you're a Bugatti and you're building a Bugatti car in Katia, you have a lot of, re you know, I don't know if you understand the way Bugatti works. They do a lot of research building those cars. Their business model is not to build a Bugatti. Their business model is to build the intellectual property, the knowledge, the research that goes into building the Bugatti, and then they sell that knowledge to other car makers. So it's important for them to protect their intellectual property. So they, they this thing about intellectual property is very important to them. That model, that Bugatti model, Katia, can be worth a billion dollars. And that model, believe me, in all the research, that is built into that model, it can't get out. So Katia is built around protecting, oh, it's, really a song book. it's built around protecting the intellectual property of a corporation. So it's centric around corporations. However, you're an individual. One day you may be the owner of an architectural firm and you may be Garcia and Associates or I happen to be FIQ, right? So around your organization you have what's called a tenant miami-dade college has a tenant if they would buy their licenses you know university of miami has a tenant and there's a tenant in california i'm connected to a tenant is like a database around an organization or an institution so all the people who are connected to that tenant like let's say that miami-dade college has 100 students they're all connected to the miami-dade tenant all those students can collaborate and work with each other. Which is great for collaboration. A level of collaboration that we've never accomplished in school, ever. Even in the 10 years I've been teaching here at Katia, we've never achieved it, okay? Because to, for me to teach you how to work together with other people is almost another discipline, right? I have to change the way you think and work and. You know, we have to overcome all kinds of uh, human barriers and limitations, like who does what, who drives the bus, you know. There's a lot to it, uh, working together. So, what's going to happen when you get your license, you're getting your own tenant. You're not becoming part of the Miami Day College tenant. You have your own server infrastructure that follows you, which is kind of crazy, but that's exactly what's happening. So, you're getting a same tenant, the same tenant that Miami Dade College has, the same tenant that University of Miami has, the same tenant that Boeing has. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. But you have that entire infrastructure, but you're one person. So you have an entire infrastructure essentially set up for an organization of 65,000 people, but you're one person. So when you get that $60 license, you have your own tenant. Now, since this never really happened before, I don't know if we can work cross tenants. I know that you can share information from one tenant. You can export your information from one tenant, give it to somebody else on a 3D XML, and they'll be able to suck in the model like a file. They'll be able to suck in the model to their tenant. That's possible. But Katia is actually more powerful than that. Katia can actually invite you can you have a tenant you can invite other people to come to your tenant think of it like your house you can have people come to your house and you can throw a big party and invite everyone to your tenant but that requires licenses to invite people into your infrastructure so i don't know if we'll be able to invite people cross tenants but yeah again we'll find out this semester for sure but you everyone in class will have their own tenant which is again 
a big departure from what we had before. Like I said, the good news is that tenant will go with you as an individual is going to follow you everywhere. So that's really important because you're not going to learn Katia one day. You're going to learn an, an unbelievable amount of, of, of information this semester. But what I want you to do is I want you to take it with you and continue developing. So when you go to your other design studio, like, like I don't get any glory of you doing this incredible project in my class and then you can never do it anywhere else. What's the point of that? There's no point. I don't get any, I don't get any, any cheap thrills out of that. So I need you guys to learn and implement. This is the best time of your life because this is the moment to learn the stuff. I learned under pressure with a gun to my head in the real world where mistakes are expensive and I sometimes have to make them and pay the price because you you mistakes are a big part of life and a big part of growing so you still have to make them. Um, the only problem is that when you make them in the outside world, they're very expensive. In school, nothing is going to happen to you here. Nothing. I'm not fitting anybody for making mistakes in my class. There's no mistake you can possibly make. All right. The only mistake you can make is not to do anything at all. That's the only mistake you can make. Other than that, you're going to pass the class and you're going to do great. What I need you to do is I need you to investigate the hell out of this tool. And I need you to take it with you and continue to develop it into your projects. So when the other students in the class are like, why do you know all these incredible tools? I'm like, well, oh, Professor Kansas class. You know? How come I didn't get to go there? Well, you didn't have one as a professor. Not my fault. Okay, but you'll be able to do amazing stuff, and then other students are gonna be like, "Whoa, I want to continue too. Uh, I don't want to be left out in the dark over here. This guy is killing me." You know, he's 3D printing things. He has walkthroughs. He has animations. He has structural analysis. I don't even. When did you learn all this? Right. So people are gonna follow. I need you guys to be leaders, and I need you to embrace the tool, and I need you to use your time in school wisely. So by the time I was in school to do, I was in school for 14 years. I have a master's in architecture, a master's in, in management of information systems, and a master's in mechanical engineering, right? I was in school for a very long time. It takes time to build this stuff. Most people, they're there for a maximum of seven, maybe seven to 10 years. Seven if you're going fast and nothing goes wrong in this world. All right, you know how that goes. So normally seven for a master's in architecture, you know, you're looking at maybe the colleges two and then FIU or undergraduates another three and then another two to maybe another three. So in that time period, if you were to take my advice and you don't have to take it, but if you were to take my advice, you have this tool that will go with you everywhere you go and you'll continue to build on it. And that building process is critical because Again, life does its ups and downs, and every time it does one of those ups and downs, it knocks you back to the floor. What I'm trying to prevent is you being knocked to the floor every time you jump to schools. And when when I went to get my master's, I was working for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. And I was, man, I was flying high, all right? When I went back to school, I, I went backwards. I was doing better when I was in industry. I'm like, oh man, I'm losing time here, you know? And it, I wasn't able to catch up to where I was in industry while in school until I was like almost graduating with my master's. It took like almost three years for me to get back to where I was when I was in Royal Caribbean. Because moving to school, starting all over, you know, all the setbacks, by the time I picked up where I left off, three years had gone by. So what I'm trying to do for you is give you a strategy that has digital continuity at its heart so you can keep building. So as you're going to the school, you're getting better, 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 more efficient, more, pro you know, you're, you have deeper knowledge of the software, you're able to do more investigations, and you don't lose your work. And then when you go to the industry and you take your smartphone and you say, look what I can do, and you're, you're going to blow it out of the water, right? Because you've had time to build yourself up, to, um, to to really understand the technology. I'm talking about technology, but I want to back up for a minute. One of the reasons why I like Katia so much 
is because I always wanted to understand construction. Because I always felt that if I didn't understand how that building out there was being built, I was a stupid architect. And I didn't want to be a stupid architect. I wanted to be an architect who was competent and understood the building. Back then, the, the best thing that the industry could say, well, if that's what you want to do, then you need to go work for a contractor. And you need to build for a couple years so you understand what those drawings mean when you're building a building. And that was the only choice. That was the only option. The only avenue that existed was to actually go build buildings. Not all of us can go build buildings. What I like about the possibility of Katia and its ability to be a virtual environment for project development is that you can completely virtually build the building, which I can't say that for a tool like Revit or, or BIM tools in general. Katia is more like a, a virtual twin. That's why I'm calling it a virtual twin and not a BIM. You can really build the building. Not only can you design it, you can also explore its construction, which is critical because, because we have this fragmented process in the building industry. What occurs is that uh, that fragmented process doesn't allow you to take constructability into the design. Uh, again, we're 30 years behind the uh, advanced manufacturing. So in advanced manufacturing, we have something called DFMA, that means Design for Manufacturing and Assembly. Because once upon a time, I remember when my dad got, um, my brother got a Monte Carlo with a turbo. And this was when turbos were first coming out. And we opened the hood of the car. You couldn't stick a wrench anywhere in that engine to get to that turbo van. You had to take out the entire engine of the car if you wanted to service that turbo. So, design for manufacturing and assembly wasn't taken into account. So yeah, they can build it but you can't service it. And the building industry has this problem where you can build it, but then getting access to panels, getting access to systems, disassembling a building. We don't disassemble buildings, we blow them up. Why are we blowing them up? Because we never took assembly into consideration. So the only thing we can do is blow it up because we can't disassemble it. Does that make sense? Am I just talking, talking smack here? We need to shift the way we're thinking about a building, all right? So Katia allows you to take in not only the design, but incorporate into the design process, how are you going to build this building, right? So when I work for my clients in the real world out there, we're answering questions like, how? How are we going to build this building? How are we, what is the construction sequence that we're going to employ? And yes, and all of that is possible. Where are you going to put the crane? What is the movement of the cranes? Is this safe for people? Where, what's the staging area for construction? All those things are being integrated into the model. So when you're working on a tool like Katia, you can incorporate into the design process the constructability of your building. So if you care about things like modular design, modular construction, or panelization like we're talking about right now, you got to take into account how you're going to construct that building. But the beauty of a tool like Katia is that you can build into it, the constructability can be built into the model. Versus the way that we do it now, you leave out the constructability and then you hand it off to somebody else for them to figure it out and to tell you how they're going to do it. And if you agree, so you, and if they say, hey, that can't be done that way, you have to change your design, you don't have the power, you lose power. And now you have to say, yes, sir. Yes, I'm gonna go back and change my design because you can't build it. So who's, who's controlling the operation there? The other guy who's telling you, hey, sir, Mr. Architect, we can't build that, sorry. Your problem, not mine. So when you have more control of the process, you can say, hey, Mr. Constru contractor, manufacturer, fabricator, this is buildable. If you can't build it, I'm gonna go find the next guy who can, you know? Or you'll be able to say, well, what can we do to build this? And they will be able to take in that model and modify it accordingly to make it constructible, to make it fabricatable, okay? But you haven't lost control of the process, nor did you lose your design. Does that make sense? So I, this is why I describe this class as the beginning of design freedom, because my goal is to re-empower the architect 
and not to make him more powerful than other people, but to make him um, a more valuable player in the people who are making contributions to the development of that building and making sure that they don't get marginalized in the process. I think there's a more powerful role for the architect than, than what the, the, the standard of the industry has been doing for the last 20, 30 years. Um, for those architects that want a more involved role, they want more hands-on process with their building, they want to take more ownership of their design, making sure that designs don't get bad engineered out, then you need to drive that process. For example, you might have a curvy piece of glass. If you talk to the wrong people, they can, they're going to tell you we can't do that curvy piece of glass. But if you control, if you have a good grip of the manufacturing process, you can go to people who bend glass and they'll be able to make that glass for you. And you won't have to change your design. And because you're doing it through advanced manufacturing, you can use fabricators in China to do that glass for the same price that a flat glass costs in here in the United States. So that makes your design possible, where otherwise you would lose control of your design and now you would end up with a flat piece of glass which might look terrible. And, and when it looks terrible, they're not going to blame the, guy, the glass guy or the contractor. They're going to say, look at that stupid architect that made this really ugly thing over here. Why didn't he do it cool, cool, pretty? Why didn't he make it like a nice curvy piece of glass? It looks horrible. And the architect is being blamed for stuff that's not out of his, it's not his control. So let's take some control back. Let's take some ownership back of the process. And let's be a higher level contributor in this process. So that's what you're looking at when you're looking at these tools. We have, a, it's about 11.30, we have a few minutes. So let me... So I like to I like to log on to the platform. So anyways, well, please please go ahead and um, get your your license of Katia. They're just going to ask you a few things here. You just need one of sixty bucks, you know. You you know you just pay here, and then they're going to ask you for proof that you're in the class. So you just need to provide them that you're in the class. Um, you can take a screenshot that you're enrolled in my class. That's good enough. I uh, believe me, this whole system knows who I am. You say I'm Hector Kansas student, they know who I am. Okay? So um, go ahead and do that and they they will prove you if they don't, I will reach out and get you approved. Alright, so if you have any problems, please let me know. Alright, so once we're in um, once we're in a tool like Atia. Once you once you go through this process, you're gonna end up with um, you're gonna end up with a, like a registration. Give me a second here. Let's make it real fast. I want to see where I am. I think one of my browsers froze up real fast. Let me see. So when you um, once you go through the registration process, you're gonna land on something that looks like this. This is actually the um, the login to the platform. So you'll use your 3KD which you will create, and you you will in the process of registering, you're going to do that. Once that's done, you can have it remember you. So if you don't want to constantly be asked what the password is, I go ahead and do that. Um, if you're on a safe device that's in your control, I recommend that. Again, they this tool is very sensitive because remember it's designed to protect intellectual property. So for example, if all of a sudden you happen to open this computer in Iran, in Iraq, or in like in Malaysia, and you've been 95% of the time in Miami, it's gonna lock up. It's gonna say, wait a minute, this person's never logged in from this location. And then you're gonna have to go through a verification process to make sure it's actually you and not someone who hacked you and is now using your, your platform in another country. Again, you might be Amazon, who cares? Well, Rolls-Royce engine cares. Boeing cares. The Defense Department cares. You may not care, but people who use Katia care because they're protecting their assets. So that's why it is that way. So it's very secure. But if you're going to be secure for some time, you can say, remember me, and it'll, it'll remember who you are.
So Katia is like an engine that takes a little bit of a moment to warm up. Um, so you're going to see a couple of things. When you first uh, log on to the platform, it's going to, again, you can see I'm on a web browser. And um, you're going to see a couple of things. Uh, again, it's going to tell you a little bit about um, the platform. I, I recommend that you poke around a lot in the beginning and you get familiar with, with the platform as much as possible. Again, I used to have one that was called the Miami Day SOA. This here, where it says H Camps and it has this weird number, that's actually my tenant because uh, I have my own license of it. So you you're gonna have your own license of it. So that's where the that's the address of the server that is uh, basically being saved there. Again, yeah, you can see I have another tenant called Academic uh, Academy California. There's actually the tenant from SciArc. So I'm connected with people in SciArc and they gave me access to their tenant in SciArc. So I have two tenants. And if we had the Miami Day tenant, it would say MDC SOA. But again, Miami Day didn't do that this semester. So that's why I was saying that I would have my own tenant and you're gonna have your own tenant. Now, here you have um, your profile. So if you click here, you can see um, this is who I am. If you click my profile, this is like social media meets project development. Okay. So I recommend that you know you take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself because you are part of that infrastructure, right? You're uh, again. You can see here's my office. I don't really have much here. Again, this tenant is brand new for me. Uh, my other tenants have more information. There's a new tenant for me, so I don't have much of a profile. But I recommend that. You add a picture of yourself, things like that is useful. And people can find you. So you, when you're part of this network, let's say somebody wants to collaborate with you from around the world, they can collaborate with you. They can, they can find you. They can connect with you. So, you know, go ahead and, and fill this out. You can you know, change your picture and be more, you know, be more personable. All right. So as you can see, everything here is running on, on these, like, these, these little windows that pop up. This here is uh, the compass, okay? And the compass is where you find everything. So all your collaborative apps on the north, all your 3D apps are on the left, your virtual reality or simulation is on the bottom, and your business intelligence apps are basically on the right. So for example, if I click here on, on 3D, you're going to see all the roles and all the tools that are available for that $60 license. So that's a lot. And I know what you're thinking. Holy crap. Because each one of those are programmed all by themselves. Every single one. So how many how many applications are KT? I don't even know the exact number. I don't know, 180? Yeah, I bet you didn't know there was that much software in the world. Another thing that happens is that the roles, um, I want to I wanna show you a little bit of the way it's structured. Because the compass is not just a nice to have, it's not just a pretty idea, it's not just, um, it's not just there for show and tell. In total, the 3 experience platform, which is what you're looking at, has 1,080 applications. Now the problem is we don't have enough time in this world to talk about 1,080 applications. I don't have enough time to you. Even if I talk my ass off, which I've already talked a lot today, all right? Even if I just spent my entire time talking, I don't have enough time to explain to you what all those applications do. No one does. And no one can sell you that many different applications. And if I say, well, Katia can do everything, sounds like a really stupid thing to say. And they won't believe you, even if it were true, they wouldn't believe you anyway. Because it's not within their frame of reference. They've never seen a tool like this, and they never have had access to like tool or tool like this. And the sad part about it, they probably never will. Most people never, ever, will ever come anywhere near this tool. They won't have access. They don't get there. Which has been a big frustration for me because I want to change the world. I want to revolutionize the building industry. I want more people 
to join the, the cause, you know? Again, that's my intention. The soul system is happy with there being only a few people. Now, I had a conversation with them once about that issue. And they said, yeah, we would like for the building to, to, for more people to embrace the, the technology. Um, and I said to them, well, your business model only caters to the, the top 1% of the industry. You already have everyone who's famous. Who, who should I go after? New, new famous people? Because you already have all the famous ones. Everyone who matters in the building industry is already a client. Tahadi, Kadrava, Frank Gehry, Coop Hemingblau, Morphosis, UN Studio. Everyone we worship is already a customer. So the only people who's left is anybody less than 1%. It's the other 99. So in the other 99, they're in the standard. See the problem? I want to grow the 1% to at least 2 you know, or maybe three, pushing four. But right now, the tool exists for the 1%. So, yeah, um, that is a problem. Again, I'm talking from Hector Camps. The South system might beat me up for saying half of the things I'm saying right now. But I'm trying to make it accessible to more people or maybe to somebody like me who wants to do these incredible buildings but didn't have a chance. Uh, and I had to kick and scream my way to the top because I hell I would not be held back and hell that I'm not going to have access to these tools when I saw what Katia did or you know, was capable of doing the guy who showed me Katia I went up to him and I said to the guy I'm like man you just ruined me man you know why because whatever the hell I was doing five minutes ago I can never go back to that Tim because you just demonstrate to me what a waste of time my life has been up to this point. And it's impossible for me to go back to my chair. I need to get to where you are. What he did at that moment was the year was 2003. I already had seen Katia from my years of Royal Arabian. But around 2000, uh, MIT started teaching Katia and they started doing parametric modeling. And they had this like really complex model, like panelized model of a surface with all these louvers and on this complex form, which each one of one of those panels were unique, down to nuts and bolts. And similar to what we did here in class on the video, where they changed the surface and that entire louver system updated, that change is impossible to do. And I said to the guy, I'm like, you know, that change represents maybe six to eight months worth of rework. And you just did that change in five minutes, man. And updated the entire model and all the documentation with it. And the structure and the MEP systems that run through there. There's no possible way I can go back to my chair and do whatever it was I was doing five minutes ago. You made it impossible, impossible for me to go back. What happened was that model, this model was shown by Gary Technologies. Uh, in the early days, it came from MIT. That model was so powerful, it was scary, man. It was scary because it did what a team of 30 people working for six months can't do, man. And it was one guy. And that was the words of paradigm shift. That shifted my perspective so radically that I knew instantly, like, yeah, I gotta go on this way. Whatever it takes, man. Who do we have to kill? Because I just could not go back to it. And keep in mind, I just won the Innovation Award from Autodesk. I had just won the Innovation Award from Autodesk. And I had to drop everything I was doing. And I, again, I could have gone the easy way because Autodesk was already celebrating me. I. 10,000 10, people saw my model in Las Vegas at, at one of the biggest conferences I've ever seen in my entire life. And my project was shown to 10,000 people in a room bigger than almost half the size of this campus on a 40-foot screen. 40 feet. 
and the CEO of Autodesk was there. I had just won the Innovation Award. And I had to drop it like it was hot because what that gentleman saw, what I saw that day was so radical, so unbelievable, so holistic, so complex, so interconnected, um, so advanced that if the world saw what I saw that day, it would have revolutionized the entire building industry overnight. So I knew after seeing that, um, there was two realities happening in cost. There, there was two realities. This is the, the consensus reality that we all know and it's the standard reality that we all see and experience. And then there's a group of people that don't have those limitations and they're operating at this unbelievable level. I want to make sure that I'm among those people. I don't want to be out of the club. You know, I don't like clubs, but I don't want to be out of that club. So, so here we are. So this tool will do a lot for you. So that's a lot of information. It's organized in roles, my favorite apps, and apps. If I expand roles, you can see here, what Katia will do is going to filter for the roles. Like for example, that if you want to know what Innovator 3 Innovator is, you click on it, and there's the, the web, there's the web-based application tools. So in the video the guy's showing, he's not going to give you this explanation. He's not going to talk to you about the tree, the structure, and how it's organized. He's just going to open it. It's just going to be there. And you know what? My brother, for those of you who speak Spanish, my brother says, how are we going to learn, learn this? He would say, a carratilla. We're going to wheelbarrow it. Because, again, I don't have time to go through the 20 years. You're just going to have to take my word for it. That's what's happening. Okay? This is the... Um, Oh, this is the X shape tool I was telling you about. Um, here's the um, X generator tool. These things will open up on the web browser. Like if I click on one of these here, for example, whenever you see the icon here that looks to the right, that icon tells you that it's going to open up on a web browser. So whenever you look at the little, the little thing on the right, that's what that does. So. Once you open it up, it's going to look something like this. Let's see? And then you can say, you know, create model. And there's, again, it's telling you uh, what location is being saved, what my role is, who I am, and the design range. Notice the design range has a couple different categories. Small, normal, large, and extra large. Extra large it's kind of one of the things, again, you know, people are going to ask you, why, why Katia? You can answer that question any way you like. One of, one of those answers is like extra large. So when I was a student in school, if I had a model of a doghouse on my computer and I tried to rotate it, uh, AutoCAD would basically crash. You know, you know, all these computers you take for granted with, you know, dual processors and, you know, 64 gigs of RAM and, you know, solid state drives. Now, nah, you rotate that model, the computer would be like, eh, 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 and it crashes. Which, which made the, the perspective that creating a 3D model of a building was an impossibility. And then Frank Gehry made the Guggenheim. And then there was this massive disconnect. So how is it possible you build the Guggenheim and I can't rotate a doghouse? Where's the problem? I, there's two realities here. And... There's two realities here. I'm sorry, there's two realities here. I wish there wasn't two realities here. You have a choice of which one you want to be in. The problem is the more you hang around with me, the more you see the other reality, and the more you become aware of the, the limitations of the other one. And it sucks. And I'm sorry for that. But it is the truth. All right? So, extra large. Imagine you want to build a BIM model from here to Orlando. Can you do that? You can in Katia. So, for example, when you do extra large, what you're talking about is infrastructure. So, if you want to build a highway from here to Orlando or a train station or a train line from here to Orlando, sure, no problem. And that is the extra large. The X, the small, we're talking about things in the microns. So, really small, like silicon graphics, like really, really things like computer chips, tiny, like microscopic. Okay? You want to build microscopic models? 
Perfect. You want to build nanotechnology robots? I'm sure you can do it in Katia, that's no problem. So we're probably somewhere on the normal to the large range. We don't have to go, we're not making a hyperloop from here to Cuba. So I don't think we need to do the extra large. But it's it, we, for most buildings, we're probably going to be okay between normal and large. All right. I'll just click normal real fast. And again, notice that what I'm doing right now is running on a web browser. So it's setting up the instance on the server, it's creating the space on there. And it's going to jump, it's going to load, load the model in any. Now the model is going to load the environment. A couple of interesting things are happening. Um, the world already crossed into 5G during COVID. I don't know if you guys know or were paying attention to it. While everybody was sick and dying, we were putting infrastructure up. Okay? And I was really suspicious about all the trucks going around putting up infrastructure and everybody was being safe to stay home. But that was basically what was happening. So we're now in 5G, which means I used to brag because this lab was 800 megabytes per second when I was connected to these computers. And that was fast, especially when nobody was here. Now you're talking about connecting at gigabyte speeds up to five gigs per second on 5G. That's a lot. What, what that's going to do for you is that it's going to allow you to work in real time across a globally distributed network. So you guys are coming in at a time where real collaboration in 3D with devices is a possibility that just happened last year where I might be working a little bit slow per our standards now, but you're going to be working on models in real time with people from any device. So that's uh, something that's just going to change the world. Right? That, that really will change the world. Because the, the, before, if I wanted to send information at gigabyte speeds, I had to be hardwired with fiber optics. I don't know if that makes sense. I would have to have a fiber optic connection to be at a gigabyte per second. We're at five gigs per second. Let me put it to you this way. I had an office in Coconut Grove. We were on fiber optic in the office. We were we had a gigabit per second line. We paid five thousand dollars a month for it to be gigabit speeds, symmetrical up and down. The next step higher was ten gigs per second, which was um, basically telecom level connectivity so that the so the, what i'm saying is the ability to work remotely is changing and that's uh, that's something that's happening right now so again this is the um x generative environment um, again here's the tree how it looks like in the x generative environment i want to open up real quick um the x shape for a moment And then I'm going to go back here while I was doing that. I'll go back here for a second. So we have three innovator. And then we have collaborative innovator. Let me click on collaborative innovator for a second. All right, so this is the X-shape. So again, it would be, um, there are some guided towards things for you to look at. We're going to look at some of these things. Let me back up for a second here. When you're dealing with Katia, there's a lot of tools, all right? And a lot of these tools are, are based on um, the roles that you're working on. So for example, you have design engineering roles. You're gonna see you have architecture and civil engineering roles. Like if I click on architecture and civil engineering roles, I don't be, don't be too distracted by roles. Roles are the way that the Katia organizes their packages. So before we had what's called a software architect. So if you said to the software architect, well, I want to design a curvy building and I want to do analysis and I want to generate buildings. Oh yeah, and I want to do engineering knowledge template. They would architect the system for you because Katia can be custom tailored to your needs. But that's because it's big software. But the R industry, 
likes it like McDonald's. You go to McDonald's, you're like, I'll take a number one. And you don't even say cheeseburger anymore. You don't even say like, I want a McChicken. You, you're like, I'll take a number one or number two, or you know, like we want it packaged. So this kind of packages it for you a little bit, opposed to someone having to architect the system for you in a custom way. Again, it's still possible. You can, if you want to pick and choose and build your own application in Katia, you can pick and choose and put your application however you want to configure it. But again, nobody's, for our industry, we don't know what the hell we're doing with it. So we're actually, it's pretty good that it's um, packaged for us. So you're going to find a lot of tools here and one of those tools is imagine a shape. I'm just gonna click on it for a moment. So you can kind of see how this looks like when we work with it. So one of the things we're gonna be combining, we're gonna be combining imagine and shape, which is the, the subdivision surface modeling, which is very similar to clay modeling. And we'll use that to create, um, I'm thinking of recreating the aquatic center by Zahadi in London. It's, um, you know, you know, while this is opening, I'll show you what this looks like. Aquatic Center, London. Image. So my thoughts were, maybe we can recreate this building. What do you think? Too much? Am I a masochist? Should it be taken home and beaten with the ugly stick? Or should we embrace the difficult and the challenging? The point is that Katia can handle it. We can we can handle this. Um, now that we have some structural engineers in the class, uh, again, it's only 12 weeks, so I don't want to kill you guys. I don't want you like crying tears of blood here. Um, but we could we could basically recreate some of this building. Uh, definitely the structure at the top, possibly the current wall, and maybe some of the structure on how that roof is supported could be fun to entertain. Um, I wrote a letter to Zahadin asking permission to use their intellectual property. So while we're doing this, I don't just want to do it uh, without their permission. I actually, I could, do, I mean, I can find the drawings that are on the internet. You can find them. They're out there. Uh, and ultimately, they may not care one way or the other. Yeah. So if you look at the drawings, you can see that the structure is not, what's that word? Standard? Okay, it's not standard. So if you want to build, you want to be the next Ahadin, I hate to say it, man, you got to step out of the standard. But, um, that, so, for example, Kati is going to have so, so it's going to have some standards. All right, it's going to have some standards, but um, when you have complex geometry, you're not going to have out of the box standard structure systems that's going to follow that structure. So we may do a combination between some standard members. So don't so get me wrong, Kati has standard libraries for structural elements. It absolutely has it. Not only does it have it, it has it for the U.S. standard. The European standard and the Asian standard. Because uh, don't think that the structure they use in America is the same one they use in Europe, is the same one they use in Asia. They have different standards. Did you know? So it has all three libraries. Now, that being said, Zahadi's work is a little bit unique. It's not really the standard. Now, here, what you're looking at is the. Um, what you're looking at is the interface for Katia. This is actually uh, imagine shape is what the subdivision surface modeling environment looks like. All right, so so this one is the rich client version, okay? And you can tell it's rich client because it doesn't have the um, it doesn't have the address bar at the top. Now over here, the X shape. I'll go ahead and say um, new component. Okay, so this X shape is the same thing, is the same thing um, being generated in the cloud. So whether I want to work in the rich client, 
this one. Whether well, I want to work on a rich client or I want to work on the web browser, they're both um, they're both working. So guys, we're at the 11:50. Yeah, we're at 11:50. So we've reached the end of today's class. What I need you to do between now and um, next class, okay? Because again, we need a little bit of time to get going here. I sent out an email. I sent out an email. Hey, giving you instructions. So basically, what I want you to do, you got task number one. You need to get the software. So let's make sure we're operational there. And then assignment two. All right. I need remember assignment two. I need you to work on your why. You need to you need to go look at stuff. So there's two websites that are very good for the types of designs that people who use Katia use. One of those is product uh, parametric architecture. We're dealing with parametric architecture. You better believe it. So. I think it's important for you to look at what's happening in the world of parametric design because you need to start to um, you need to start having your vision. So I want you to go through here and find examples of parametric architecture. Okay. So for example, here's an example of, of someone who developed a paneling system on a surface. You kind of already see where I'm going with this, don't you? All right. So Katia can give you 100% the complex surface. Katia can give you that customized panel, which if you notice here, it's changing a little bit uh, as it's going around the surface. This is what's happening in architecture. You want to be part of it, jump on board. This is what happened. What I'm giving you are the tools, not only to design it. Remember, you can do some of these things in Rhino, not only to design it. I'm giving you the tools for you to make it. So when you develop it, you can interface with manufacturing and fabrication. You have more control of your model. So it's a, it might be difficult for you to, you may, this thing may cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to make. You don't have a couple hundred thousand dollars to make one, okay? You may not have a client ready to put that money in um, you making a prototype. But in Katia, you can essentially recreate the same exact thing virtually to full detail. When I mean that, I'm talking nuts and bolts. Down to the nuts and bolts, you can really understand it. So it's a really good tool for students who are learning about architecture. You now have a tool that you can explore the real making of things, buildings or otherwise. You can experience the real making of things in a virtual environment, which for me bridges the gap between the traditional design process and constructability. It begins to close that gap. So as an architect and as a designer, I'm bringing you closer to the field, closer with the world of making, and I'm reacquainting you with the world of making and fabrication and giving an environment that spans both worlds or multiple worlds in design, manufacturing, and even into operations. So do that, uh, work on that. You have an assignment to do a case study. I basically want you to say your first one is to do a PowerPoint uh, of an architect, designer, or fabricator that uses parametric design as part of the work process. Give a description of the firm, provide examples of their work, and tell, and tell us about it. Show a case study of one of their projects, provide examples of the parametric model, provide work site, and provide a work site page. So if you can find a rendering of the model, a picture of the model, uh, a picture of the script, make sure that you're seeing their process, not just the end product. That yeah, I want you to discover that the things that you're learning in this class is what's driving that model, right? Or and I say things because it might not be done in Katia, it might be done in Grasshopper or other tools. But I want you to understand that is that object-based programming, scripting, and and how are they developing the surface? I want you to to discover those two things. But I want you to find it. I want you to hear from me. You already heard from me enough. 
I want you to find your own truth. I want you to find your own example. So that's it for me today, guys. Next class, we jump in both feet into Katia, and I will be in communication with you throughout the week. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact me, and we're going to be meeting once a week here on Fridays. By next week, we should be operational with the software and ready to jump and, and go. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Any of your friends out there in cyberspace, you guys have any questions out there? And make sure before I, I sign off here. So, all right, so I don't think I see any questions, but if you guys do have any questions, make sure you let me know. Email me. And uh, if you have, oh, I see Wilson, you have a question. Go ahead. Let me in. Go ahead, unmute your mic there.